Recording in progress. What is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP-P.PIDS.gov.PA. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, 
and many more. On the enhanced website of SIRPE, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published, all at the same time. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and other visual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making itong bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag po'y siya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! is on the rise. Aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic, it has taken away people's lives and dreams. Inflation went up, driven by food and fuel prices, disproportionately affecting the poor. In Asia and the Pacific, the pandemic has doubled the multidimensional poverty level. An additional 85 million people could have been pushed back into extreme poverty, living on $1.9 per day or less. We need to take urgent action, but how? Our region is experiencing a highly uneven or so-called K-shaped recovery between countries and within countries, building forward fairer ensuring an inclusive recovery from the pandemic and taking an inclusive development path is an imperative. Thank you, Mrs. Scott. So, how do we leave no one behind? We can't simply return to normal, can we? That normal is blamed for inequality in the first place. Governments should prioritize spending on health care, education, and social protection. Of course, that increasing spending is not a golden solution. We must spend smart to heal the long-term scars left by the pandemic. We need to prioritize universal basic healthcare services over everything else. Children receiving high quality education from their early years is our priority. We must shield people in need, vulnerable groups and informal workers. Tax fair should be the leading principle for obtaining budget revenues. Nobody and no company should avoid paying their share. Prevention is always better than cure. 
Before taxes and transfers, we must focus on pre-distributive policies. It's important that we set up countries for success through strong political systems that allow for checks and balances, strong institutional arrangements, and enough job-rich structural transformation that creates opportunities for all. Fast transformation and new technologies will be disruptive. Governments should act more proactively to guide their direction, shape their trajectory and manage shocks for inclusive outcomes. Can central banks play a role in inclusive development? We can and we should. I believe it's time for us to step up our game and tackle rises in equality. Right now, only half of the central banks in the region are taking up an inclusive finance agenda. And it's such a missed opportunity. As policymakers, we can make the conduct of monetary policy more mindful about inequality. As investors, we can mobilize part of the $9.1 trillion official reserves in the Asia-Pacific region for social purposes. As currency issuers, we can explore how central bank digital currencies can foster financial inclusion. As financial regulators, we can encourage more use of innovative financial instruments for inclusive development. Thank you, colleagues. In looking ahead, the Asia-Pacific region must aim for inclusive recovery to promote the well-being of both people and the planet. Do you maybe have clear and ready-to-use guidelines to tackle inequality? As a matter of fact, we do. Download the SCAP flagship publication. Follow our recommendations for building forward fairer. And it worked, right? It worked, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Our virtual policy forum this afternoon is in partnership with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or UNSCAP. I'm Sheila Sior, your moderator. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an overwhelming negative impact on the growth path of many countries, including the Philippines. The pandemic also disproportionately affected the vulnerable and marginalized groups and exacerbated existing socioeconomic inequalities. This afternoon, our resource persons from UNSCAP and PIDS will share their studies and recommendations that deal with two important related themes. First, how to make an inclusive post-pandemic recovery for the Asia-Pacific region. And second, how to improve the Philippines' fiscal sustainability to support its recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. To start our conversation, may I call on the president of PIDS, Dr. Anisette Arbeta Jr., to open our virtual event. Dr. Arbeta. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the presence of the following who choose to be with us this afternoon. From the government, we have the Department of Budget and Management Under Secretary. Rolando Toledo, uh, Department of Labor and Employment Undersecretary Benjo Santos Binavides, Department of Foreign Affairs State Secretary and Vice Consul Rain Mendoza, Executive Directors, Directors, Deputy Secretary General and Assistant Commissioner of the Senate Economic Planning Office, House of Representatives, Department of Interior and Local Government, Bureau of Local Government Finance, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, and Bureau of Internal Revenue. We'd like also to welcome our uh, uh, Board of Trustees member, Dr. Gilbert Llanto. And uh, from the academe, let me acknowledge the uh, following. University of the Philippines Baguio Professor Emeritus L.C. Jimenez. Uh, University of Visayas Executive Director uh, Victorina Susa. Uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Calawan Campus Director Arlene Carey. Mindanao State University Main Campus Director Pandao Pula, University of the Philippines Berata School of Economics there, Joel Tan Torres. From the international and developed dip diplomatic community and civil society, we have World Bank Sen Senior Economist Kevin Choa, uh, and International Labor Organization Senior Economist Pu Yun, uh, Asian Parliamentarians for Human Rights Director Tom Villarin, Philippine Embassy of Tokyo Minister and Consul. Uh, Evangeline Ong Jimenez Duruk and Barcelona Heritage and Development and Council CEO Henry Estepona, uh, Philippine Association of Migrant Workers and Advocates, Philippine Trade and General Workers Organization President Bernadette Guzman, Philippine Business for Social Progress Executive Director Elvin Ivan Oi, Lorna Community Development Foundation Incorporated Executive Director Andrew Cesar Rimando, Meticulously Justified Delivering Service for Humanity Incorporated Executive Director Juan Paulo Rodriguez and Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy Director Salma Pir Rasul. Let me greet our friends from the media. Finally, let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, and those watching through the PIDS uh, Serpy Facebook pages. On behalf of PIDS and our event partner, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or UNSCAP. I welcome you to this public webinar titled Toward an Inclusive Economic Recovery and Development in Asia Pacific Region and Ensuring Fiscal Sustainability in the Philippines. The rapid development of Asia Pacific economies over the past decades has put millions of people out of poverty. However, the region's economic success has not been equal across various levels. The failure of individual countries and areas to grow together led to sca scaring effects, uh, especially during the pandemic, which brings the issue of inequality to the fore. In addition, recent global financial crisis and COVID-19 pandemic have put these issues into the mainstream of macroeconomic policies. While still emerging from the impacts of the pandemic, the global economy has been shaken again, this time by geopolitical events that threatened set back the nascent post-pandemic economic recovery and the pursuit of the 2020, 2030, 
agenda for sustainable de development in the Asia Pacific region. Moreover, the economy, the economically vulnerable poor, uh, poor people will likely bear the uh, brunt of this uh, shock again, in the form of high fuel and food prices. These are happening with fiscal resources of developing Asia Pacific countries already stretched due to the two years of the pandemic. Increased and inclusive spending to support human development is critical in spurring uh, sustainable recovery and development while uh, countering the inequalities across the Asia Pacific region. Policies and programs must include strengthening healthcare, education, food systems, and universal social, social protection, as well as having bold investments in job creation, the green transition, gender equality, and opportunities for the youth. For the Philippines, the COVID-19 pandemic usually impacted the current level of the debt in the country. The Philippines' debt to, gro to gross domestic product ratio climbed from 39.6% in 2019 to 60.5% in 2021. The debt increase resulted from a widening fiscal deficit triggered by a steep, steep collapse in government revenues and a rise in public spending to support the country's public health system and provide relief a response to the pandemic. The Institute's macroeconomists said that the debt to GDP ratio is still manageable. However, returning to the pre-pandemic levels will be a challenge in the near term. This afternoon, we will feature two presentations prov providing valuable inputs clarifying these issues. The first presentation is UNS CUP's Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2022. The survey suggests that the Asia-Pacific economies adopt a building forward fairer policy agenda. In particular, the report proposes that Asia-Pacific Asia economies must prioritize inclusive growth, whereby citizens of uh, all socioeconomic groups can improve their livelihoods, income, health, and education levels. It also revises the macroeconomic and structural policies and lays a roadmap for inclusive post-pandemic recovery and development. The presenter, UNS Economic Affairs Officer Michael Kudowski, will give us the highlights of the UNS report. The second presentation is the PIDS study titled Fiscal Effects of COVID-19 Pandemic Assessing Public Debt Sustainability in the Philippines. The paper examines whether the current level of debt in the country remains on a sustainable path given the national government's fiscal policy and plans. We have PIDS Senior Research Fellow Margarita de Buque Gonzalez, Senior, Senior Research Fellow Justin Sikat, and Research Associate Jan Paul Corpus to present their papers, findings, and key messages. To enrich our discussion, we invited experts who will share their insights on the service key points and recommendations for the Asia Pacific region to achieve inclusive, sustainable growth post pandemic and to keep the Philippines' level of debt on a sustainable path given economic challenges. We have Banco Central ng Pilipinas Senior Assistant Governor uh, of Monetary Pol Policy Subsector, uh, Ilumida da Sikat, and Philippine Tax Academy President and Department of Finance Chief Economist, Hill Beltran. We are deeply honored to have you at this seminar. Before I end, let me take this opportunity to thank the UNS Cup for co-organizing this event with us. We are honored that you have chosen PIDS again as your dissemination partner in the Philippines for your 2022 survey report. To our attendees, we appreciate your presence and continued participation in our webinar series. Thank you. I now give back the floor to the moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta. To give us his thoughts about the topic of our virtual forum is the United Nations Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator for the Philippines, Mr. Gustavo Fernandez Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez has more than 25 years of extensive managerial and leadership experience in development, humanitarian affairs, and peace building, performing for several UN entities across Central America, Africa and the Middle East. Let us listen to the message of Mr. Gonzalez. Greetings from the United Nations in Manila. 
Dr. Aniceto Orbeta, President of the Philippines Institute for Development Studies, close partners of the United Nations. Ms. Illuminata Sicat, Senior Assistant Governor of the Banco Central de Filipinas. Mr. Gil Beltran, President of the Philippines Tax Academy and also Chief Economist of the Department of Finance. Colleagues from the UNSCAP, partners from governments, central banks, academe, development community. Today's forum is very timely, as we are confronted to significant, multiple and interlinked development challenges. And this is at the global, regional and country levels. And let me just to refer to three of them. Number one, with only eight years left to 2030, the UN Secretary General has called for us to rescue, this is the word that he used, rescue the Sustainable Development Agenda, which is at risk of not being achieved. This is a compelling call to join our capacities, knowledge and resources more than ever. Number two, the road to recovery from COVID-19 remains long. And even if the situation in the Philippines is better today than it was two years ago, the World Health Organization is telling us to remain cautious as the risk of new COVID-19 variants is ever present. And number three, the food, energy and finance crisis generated by the Ukraine conflict and amplified by the COVID-19 and the climate emergency may have serious impact, such as increasing global hunger and sparking social unrest. For us, working in the Philippines, our core agenda is to leave no one behind, which in very practical terms means contributing to the reduction of inequalities in all its forms. And let me just highlight inequalities in three areas that have been particularly exacerbated by the pandemic. The first one is inequality in education. Most of you are aware of the learning losses generated by the pandemic and related school closures. We know that almost two thirds of the 2.3 million out of school children and youth come from families with a lower socioeconomic status. We know that 25 million children have been learning only remotely for almost two years with over 80% of children unable to access online learning. Very recently, in June 2022, more than 30% of schools remain closed for in-person classes since March 2020. And in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Maslin, Mindanao, only 5% of schools have reopened. The second one is gender inequality. The gap in women's labor force participations continues to persist with only 42.5% of women in the job market, women's participation in the broader labor force needs our attention. And although the Philippines ranks fourth among Asian countries in the proportion of women in middle and senior managerial position, this is at 25%, obstacles to career advancement of women still persist. Another well-known example is the unequal distribution of unpaid care work responsibilities between women and men, with the former doing at least twice more than the latter. The third one is climate inequality. As you know, the Global Climate Risk Index ranks the Philippines number four for countries affected by climate-induced hazard. 
The country as a whole is already highly vulnerable to the impact of climate change. And what we learned from last year's super typhoon Odette was that its impact was on already fragile regions that were affected by the diverse range of inequalities. For instance, we found that almost 1.7 million houses were damaged and houses made from light materials were hit the hardest. The six regions placed under a state of calamity due to the super typhoon, they already had very high stunting prevalence. More than one third of households in five of those regions were unable to afford a diet that would meet nutritional needs. So addressing these and other challenges requires significant financial resources. And we fully recognize the difficulties with making spending decisions in the context of tight fiscal space faced by the government in the short term. But experience shows that strategic investment in the immediate term addressing such inequalities can bring massive returns in the long term. Education-related spending can help reduce the estimated productivity losses, which is equivalent to $219 billion of dollars projected over the next 40 years caused by the pandemic. Investment in climate resilient infrastructure and building better pro-poor and vulnerable communities will not only save lives, but also reduce the cost of damages and losses as we know, estimated in $1.6 billion of dollars per year from 2005 to 2014. Very soon, we will start formulating the new UN cooperation framework with the government to align with the priorities of the new Philippines Development Plan for 2023 to 2028. And I'm sure that the insight generators in today's forum will contribute to improving our future plans. So I thanks again our partner Speeds and our colleagues from ESCAP for organizing today's forum. And of course, we wish you all a productive day. Thank you. And thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez, for your insightful message. So before we proceed uh, to the presentations, may I uh, request all our speakers to turn on your videos for a brief photo opportunity. We will be assisted by uh, Gwen, our platform host. Gwen? Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Uh, may I request everyone to, uh, all our speakers to turn on your videos, please, and give us your best smiles. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, so uh, having set the context for our discussion this afternoon, I think all of you are uh, now excited to listen to the presentations. But before I call on the first speaker, allow me to remind you of our guidelines to join the discussion. So you may post your questions and comments using the Q&A button. I repeat, please use the Q&A button. Please indicate your name and organization if you'd like to be identified when I read out the questions. To all the presenters and discussants, you may respond by typing your answers, which will be uh, visible to, to all the attendees. Alternatively, you can choose to answer the questions live during the open forum. For our live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. Please use the comment section on Facebook for your questions. And we will accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. Okay, so um, on that note, I invite you to listen to our uh, first speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Michael uh, Podolsky who will present the key uh, messages of UNSCAP's Economic and Social Survey 2022. Mr. Podolsky is an economist. His research and policy advice focus on macroeconomic developments and the impact of technology on the economy. 
prior to his current post at UNS CAP, he worked as an economist for the UN Secretariat in New York. Mr. Podolsky, you may proceed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. So um, let me please uh, share the presentation and uh, let's start. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it very well and your OD is also fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, during this presentation, um, I will briefly tell you what's uh, in um, ESCAP flagship report on uh, economic and social issues in Asia Pacific. This report is uh, written every uh, every year and uh, tackles the most injured, uh, ardent um, po policy challenges uh, the region faces. So just a brief timeline note before we start. So uh, we usually prepare the report in the fourth quarter of every year and the first quarter of the following one. So this was between uh, September and March 2021-22. So uh, some parts of the macroeconomic outlook uh, will be naturally a bit uh, outdated, uh, largely because of the ongoing crisis, the war in Ukraine. Uh, nevertheless, um, there is uh, a big part of the report, like most of the report focuses on long-term trends on inequality. So the topic of inequality was chosen uh, because of the pandemic, because we're observing the key shape recovery, and uh, we're wondering what can be done to address these challenges now. And there is also another part which discusses how to tackle uh, fiscal and how to shape fiscal and monetary policies during the crisis times which we were at that time were referring to the crisis we observed in 2020-21, but uh, it stays uh, same applicable, applicable to the events we're observing these days. So inequalities are rising actually already uh, before the pandemic, and this was uh, also on a coming in and out uh, in the discussions on economic issues. But what happened during the pandemic is that we observed uh, way, way more people were being left behind. So this was also the spark which triggered to go beyond traditional thinking and look what can be done more uh, given the resources uh, that, that, that the governments have. So let me now start first with the outlook or brief uh, macroeconomic update on what happened during the pandemic and the short outlook we had at the time. And then we'll move to the discussion on fiscal policies uh, my, my monetary policies and uh, on structural policies which shape inequalities in long term. So during the pandemic, uh, the GDP growth uh, in all the Asia Pacific region contracted uh, just by 0.3%, although this was not equal uh, within the region. So for example, for Southeast Asia, this has been estimated at minus 3.9. This relates to different structures of the economies, different exposure to exports and uh, imports. But then uh, we observed a strong rebound in following 2021. Uh, this rebound uh, was driven largely by uh, manufacturing and industrial uh, production as well as uh, external uh, demand. Nevertheless, even if the, the, the rebound was strong, uh, then the total loss uh, of GDP uh, during the 20, 2020 and 2021 was estimated uh, a few months ago at around 2 trillion. Uh, these days we should expect actually more given the challenges related to the global fuel and food crisis and the rising uh, in inflation. And uh, as our outlook is usually more uh, on the whole region, but there is there's still huge differences and discrepancies within the region because the, the region is very, uh, very diverse. Wherever you look, the economies are at different level of economic development. They have different structures. So uh, for Soviet Asia, for example, uh, the contraction in 2020 was pretty severe. If we look at uh, East and Northeast Asia, the contraction was uh, less severe and actually happened earlier and the rebound was also a bit stronger. So uh, we have to keep in mind that whenever we talk about regional economies, like we should probably just stay focused on uh, national economies. And for example, zooming in on uh, just uh, Soviet Asia, uh, we can see that Philippines experienced severe recession in 2020, where uh, 
neighboring almost Vietnam, the, the, the GDP growth stayed positive. So like, again, when we're uh, thinking about the policies which we will present later, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing them in a context that they, they matter where they're implemented, how they're implemented, and on the local uh, national context. Regarding the inflation, uh, which uh, is now on most of the headlines, this was already a problem uh, a few months back. So we've been observing the rise in commodity prices, the food prices were already a problem during the pandemic. Uh, this was uh, pushed up by the shipping costs, by currency depreciations, and of course, uh, fiscal and monetary policies were very expansionary during the crisis 20, in 2020 and 2021, where the governments were aiming to boost the recovery. But on, on top of this, we cannot forget that we have the new shocks which happened this year, uh, in particular the, the war in Ukraine and the, the, the rising food and oil prices. So uh, regarding the outlook, uh, this is what you can see here, this 5% more or less. Uh, this was still at the uh, few, few months ago. These days, uh, these outlooks are revised down, unfortunately. So we should not expect them be being that strong. The inflation will remain certainly a problem for the foreseeable future. As long as the war will be going on, we should also not expect major probably changes. And given what did these, uh, these events, the scars on uh, the macroeconomic stability uh, will be very permanent and they are still rising, which means that when we think about the policies uh, which should decrease the inequalities, uh, we should think about them how they will decrease them in the long term because it won't be easy to recover from uh, what happened. So uh, why, sh why should we care about inequalities actually? Because inequalities has been there like almost always in the past, but Moving towards the Agenda 2030 and trying to uh, become more and develop and sustainable and fair in uh, our economic development, we have to take into consideration what's happening to women, what's happening to youth and informal workers. So uh, the, the previous model, the, 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 how the economic development was done in the past was not always taking care about these groups. There are also many other vulnerable populations uh, and groups in the society, but uh, it's the time to tackle it in a more uh, macroeconomic uh, way. And also, if this is not done uh, these days, probably the recovery will be slower. So it's not only this human part which we look at the more ethic part, but purely from the economic perspective, unless we decrease the inequalities, I will probably be expecting the economic growth in the future to be uh, much slower. So. Regarding the impact of the pandemic, so uh, if you are wondering what happened during the 2020 and 21 only, for Asia Pacific, we the estimates suggest that around 85 million people were pushed back into extreme poverty, and this is number this is the number at the extreme poverty level, so the lowest threshold. If we uh, at purchasing power poverty 1.9 dollars uh, per day, so if we uh, raise it to 3.2 a bit more or 35.5 we see that it's around 160 million which been pushed and this doesn't include the events uh, of the 2022 so uh, addressing this gap we uh, we found this uh, the messages needs to flow down through fiscal policies central banking and structural transformation at the same time as I will show later none of these can be handled separately and in times of crisis like this, this is uh, this is a time to uh, work on all possible uh, policy fronts to to tackle the inequalities and ensure that the recovery is faster and stronger and more sustainable. So, let me now play you a short video, which summarizes uh, the messages from the survey, and then I will discuss in slides uh, in a more detailed way uh, what's happening and what, what, what do we observe and what are the policy options to consider to, to recover faster and stronger.
Inequality is on the rise. Aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic, it has taken away people's lives and dreams. Inflation when and fuel prices disproportionately affecting the poor. In Asia and the Pacific, the pandemic has doubled the multidimensional poverty level. An additional 85 million people could have been pushed back into extreme poverty, living on $1.9 per day or less. We need to take urgent action, but how? region is experiencing a highly uneven or so-called K-shaped recovery between countries and within countries. Building forward fairer, ensuring an inclusive recovery from the pandemic and taking an inclusive development path is an imperative. Thank you, Mrs. Scapp. So how do we leave no one behind? We can't simply return to normal, can we? That normal is blamed for inequality in the first place. Governments should prioritize spending on health care, education, and social protection. Of course, that increasing spending is not a golden solution. We must spend smart to heal the long-term scars left by the pandemic. We need to prioritize universal basic health care services over everything else. Children receiving high-quality education from their early years is our priority. We must shield people in need vulnerable groups and informal workers. Tax fair should be the leading principle for obtaining budget revenues. Nobody and no company should avoid paying their share. Prevention is always better than cure. Before taxes and transfers, we must focus on pre-distributive policies. It's important that we set up countries for success through strong political systems that allow for checks and balances, strong institutional arrangements, and enough job-rich structural transformation that creates opportunities for all. Fast transformation and new technologies will be disruptive. Governments should act more proactively to guide their direction, shape their trajectory and manage shocks for inclusive outcomes. Can central banks play a role in inclusive development? We can and we should. I believe it's time for us to step up our game and tackle rises inequality. Right now, only half of the central banks in the region are taking up an inclusive finance agenda. And it's such a missed opportunity. As policymakers, we can make the conduct of monetary policy more mindful about inequality. As investors, we can mobilize part of the $9.1 trillion official reserves in the Asia-Pacific region for social purposes. As currency issuers, we can explore how central bank digital currencies can foster financial inclusion. As financial regulators, we can encourage more use of innovative financial instruments for inclusive development. Thank you, colleagues. In looking ahead, the Asia-Pacific region must aim for inclusive recovery to promote the well-being of both people and the planet. Do you maybe have clear and ready-to-use guidelines to tackle inequality? As a matter of fact, we do. Download the SCAP flagship publication. Follow our recommendations for building forward fairer. And it worked, right? It worked, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um. Welcome back. So, um, we had a brief presentation was waiting for us. So let me start now uh, with the um, fiscal policies uh, discussion and uh, the government's role in, in reducing equality. And the main focus of this part will be that not all fiscal policies are basically equally designed and equally implemented. So that spending a certain amount of money on a certain policy does not bring equal results uh, across countries, across the regions, uh, especially in terms of inequality reduction. So these graphs um, show us how expenditure on education 
uh, change uh, inequality. So this is the Gini change on the, the y-axis. So all the bars are countries from, from the SCAP regions and the dots are the rest countries in the world. So here we see what happens to inequality for every 1% of GDP spent on education. So this is a comparison of two scenarios. You can imagine we have uh, one scenario where there is no spending on education and there is another scenario where 3% of GDP is spent on education. So normalizing to 1%, we can see what's the impact and what's the change, uh, what's the difference in the inequality between these two scenarios. So we see that in some countries, uh, whatever they spend on education, it brings almost zero impact on inequality changes. And why can it happen? Uh, you can imagine that uh, the education facilities are centered in the urban areas. They don't reach out to the rural areas. They don't reach out to the vulnerable populations, to the poorer people. So in this way, spending on education will actually not decrease the inequalities. And by contrast, there are some countries which handle this uh, spending really well, but where spending on education for every 1% of GDP they commit to this policy, they have a very substantial decrease in inequalities. And this is also observed for other types of uh, fiscal policies, namely for healthcare, where you can see in some countries actually health spending on healthcare can increase inequalities. You can imagine that uh, only uh, people uh, who have uh, more money have access to, to hospitals because there are some uh, entry barriers, for instance, like the minimum uh, personal, personal spending. And there are some countries where there is universal healthcare, where actually uh, healthcare is available, at least at the basic level for everyone. So spending in this way will substantially decrease the inequality. And the same true is for, for direct transfers or indirect subsidies, depending on where they are sent and how they are targeted, how efficient they are distributed. Um, there will be a different... Everyone, good morning from Bangkok, from the UN Center. Uh, we have participants who are present in person, participants online, both from government, Mr. Podolsky, you're on mute. Okay, oh, sorry, I'm back. And the same is true uh, for the revenue side uh, of the fiscal policy. So depending how the taxes are collected, if there are personal income taxes, which are progressive, or if this is a value added tax or indirect taxes, these taxes can uh, increase or, or decrease inequality. So coming from here, uh, the first point is to, to take out from this presentation that Policies have to be well targeted and designed um, to, to, to fit the, the, the local context. Second, uh, let's think about more uh, on where are we now following the crisis regarding our fiscal space. So regarding the revenues, the, the red bars, in 2020, from 2019 to 21, we've been observed that they're going down. Well, actually the fiscal expenditure uh, went up. So, this naturally has uh, increased uh, the fiscal deficits and increased, increased our uh, median debt to GDP uh, levels, uh, which uh, we had to talk about later in during the presentation. So uh, regarding the fiscal balances, here we see what happened from 2019 is, is that the fiscal balances were actually in not a bad shape, but 2020-21 uh, has increased them dramatically. So, Having this macroeconomic, the fiscal situation where the fiscal space is really constrained, uh, we should expect consolidations. And coming back to inequality and GDP growth, uh, we did some research on what happened uh, after fiscal consolidation periods were observed in Asia Pacific, what happened to inequality and what happened to GDP growth. So starting with inequality on the, uh, in the left figure, so our uh, estimates suggest that uh, every fiscal consolidation has basically a clear, uh, is followed up by a clear increase in inequalities. Uh, you may think about, for, for the reasons thinking, uh, you can think that uh, there is less subsidies, there is less expenditure in education, less expenditure in healthcare. So all these fiscal policies which support uh, people at the bottom of the economic pyramid, they're basically cut, uh, which uh, in long term, up to uh, five years, leads the inequalities up. And regarding the GDP growth and basically recovery, uh, there is also clear sign that fiscal consolidations do decrease the future uh, GDP growth. Uh, 
So um, having in mind that it matters how we spend or where we spend and that the fiscal space is very limited and they were facing these consolidation times, so these three factors, uh, we uh, identified these three areas as one of the most important uh, for uh, long-term inequality changes, but as well as one of the most likely to be cut. So uh, they, are the, they are ones to, to, to be cut first. Uh, so looking at the regional expenditure on education, it's been already well uh, below the world averages. So world average is the red dotted line, which you can observe here. And looking at South Asia, uh, this is the continuous blue line, which is way, way below the uh, world average. In the Philippines, it was hovering around 4% uh, for, for the latest available data. So it's not only that we're starting from a point which is already uh, below the world average, but uh, it's very likely that there will be temptation to cut expenditures uh, on these healthcare policies. Second, education. Uh, so. Regarding UNESCO guidelines, uh, this is the green area here, UNESCO recommends to spend between 4 and 6% of GDP uh, on education. And uh, as for now, uh, we've observed that the median spending in uh, Asia Pacific was below the DD's level. So this is the red bars. Uh, the, the mean average was uh, a bit higher, but it also depends on the region. In the Philippines, uh, it was around 3%. Uh, so, Again, given the con remembering what was said before, that children in the region already are suffering a lot from school closures and have limited access to education, uh, this is not an area where spending should be certainly uh, cut down. Finally, social protection. So one of the reasons why we so like 85 million people falling into extreme poverty in the region or 160 at higher threshold levels was the lack of uh, social protection, social protection flaws. Uh, this relates to uh, what happened when uh, people lose their work, when they get sick. Um, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, around one third uh, of population is covered by any sort of social, at least one social protection uh, policy for the whole Asia Pacific region, it's 46%. So uh, looking at the I, I, uh, research, we see that uh, once people are not protected from falling into poverty. So it means there is no this social protection floor. Any sort of recovery takes more time, is more difficult, and uh, it, it's less sustainable. So summing up this uh, fiscal policy expenditure side, we come to the point that we need to spend smart, spend smart because the, 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 the amount of resources are very limited. So regarding the healthcare, certainly universal health coverage should be the priority. Economies which had this uh, universal health coverage before the pandemic and during, uh, experienced the less severe uh, impact of the crisis and also less severe impact on the pandemic. So in the education, especially the early uh, level education, which has the most impact on the long-term inequalities and also impacts the performance, the secondary and tertiary levels. And finally, social protection. So universal basic social protection floors are the way forward. Uh, second, uh, it's not only about spending less or more, uh, it's also about spending more efficient and less wasteful. So uh, for healthcare, the World Health Organization estimates that sometimes up to 40% of resources are wasted. So instead of looking to increase for 5%, it's sometimes a good time to look where can we improve our spending. And here the digital health technologies uh, come with lots of help. So we observed how the pandemic changed the approach of the whole healthcare system to uh, digital technologies. So online visits, online prescriptions, online registrations in, uh, for hospital visits, for doctor visits, all these saves the money and increases the efficiency and the availability of the healthcare. Uh, same for, uh, for the education, the digital divide will be probably one of the uh, expenditure areas where uh, we see that without uh, access to internet, uh, children were uh, left actually without any access to education for many years. And finally, for social protection, also digital technologies allow for immediate social transfers. They allow to have the register of people who uh, are eligible for the benefits. They cut all the middlemen or the structure which consumes uh, the money which should be devoted actually to uh, help people the, who, who need this help. Finally, let's move to um, the revenue side of the fiscal policies. So Asia Pacific itself in the region, around 22% of GDP is collected 
uh, through, uh, through through the various levels of taxes. This is actually relatively low. And uh, given that uh, having in mind Agenda 2013, all the policies we're looking for, this is uh, this this must change. And how where is the money actually um, uh, being uh, lost? So first is like tax avoidance, tax uh, misinvoicing. So around seven. 0.6% of tax revenue is lost just to the misinvoicing uh, in an informality of the economy. So companies, uh, businesses, uh, small enterprises, uh, many of them are not registered, so do not pay any taxes. So aiming to increase these tax revenues, which are then shared back in the form of healthcare education, uh, informality has to be drastically reduced in the region. So taxing fair uh, forward. So Paying the first share should be the main principle. Each company or each person who earns should pay accordingly to how they can. It, it doesn't mean that the taxation should be pushed down to the people who earn the least. No, usually it, it's still uh, people who earn or companies who have high profits due to this misinvoicing and uh, other tax avoidance measures or in total informality, they avoid the taxes, paying taxes where it would be possible. So expansion of the tax base and finally shifting the tax burden from the low income to high income households. So let's look now uh, for more root causes of, of the inequalities and look back how these things are shaped in the long term. So there is one of the hypotheses, the Kuznets hypothesis, that when the countries develop from a very low uh, development level towards the higher ones, uh, the inequality will rise. So you can imagine that you start from agrarian economy, which develops in the urban regions. So naturally the people in the urban regions or the households will get uh, richer, so the inequalities will rise. But this is the theory, and this theory is not, uh, it's not deterministic, this can change. So when we look at the real data, how these things evolve uh, throughout the years, uh, we can track how the per capita GDP was impacted the market Gini across the years in many economies. So the green line here is, for example, the Republic of Korea. So we can see that as the country was developing and the income was uh, rising, actually the inequalities were still held at the very low level and then only have risen somehow in the, in the later years. Uh, let's look at from India in other countries. So this is this example. So here we can see that as the economy was developing, inequalities were rising almost proportionally. So this means that depending on how the country develops the policies, how it distributes the wealth through the education uh, accessibility, through the healthcare, through the social protection, it all has tremendous impact on how the inequalities are shared long term. And indeed, when we see how this, uh, on the other side of the coin, you can, uh, you can think that you can redistribute the wealth, but actually redistribution of the wealth, for example, through the social transfers, it works really well, but mostly in, uh, developed economies. And when you compare this to developing economies, because of the different inf institutional st structure, like lots of informality, uh, this redistribution is actually way less important than this whole pre-distribution. So how the economy is built and shaped in a long term, if there is universal health care or not, if there is universal access to education or not. So this matters in the long term even more. So in this way, uh, we need to think on how to mobilize these strategic sectors to shape the economy in a way that will be inclusive for a uh, low-income household. To strengthen the labor's position and empower the labor so that the difference between the capital income and labor income uh, is not uh, as huge as now. And finally, uh, boiling down again to the social protection, supporting for a lifelong training, being uh, flexible and utilizing the technological changes. And finally, uh, we're moving now to the most like innovative and still uh, under consideration policies. We have to think how the monetary policy can impact uh, inequality. Because from the fiscal side and long-term fiscal impact, it's more natural and we, we feel that uh, it, it's been done for years. But there is also the monetary policy side which can be more inclusive. So making things straight, of course, the most important part of the monetary policy is to ensure that there is inflation stability. So what we see now as an inflation is the primary target always uh, for, 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 for the central banks and monetary policy. But we can also think and how uh, these uh, various uh, 
monetary policy's inca impact in common world distribution. The change in interest rates does not impact the same poor and uh, uh, richer households. Uh, the same is for official reserve management. Maybe there are ways of how to allocate these reserves in a more productive way, that this can contribute to social change, for example, through social bonds. Finally, we have the currency issue. And so now there is a discussion on how to create, uh, on how to uh, deploy the central bank digital currencies. And these currencies can have few features which uh, improve access to, 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 to finance, improve financial literacy, which is still missing at the bottom of the economic pyramid. And finally, uh, there is the financial regulation. So looking at what the, at the central bank policies, there must be increased understanding on how to create these policies that they have this pro-social financial angle in mind. So not just focusing purely on inflation, which of course is still the priority, but going this extra mile to uh, make pro uh, pro inclusive uh, changes to increase the financial support. So, regarding the key takeaways from this uh, from this survey and presentation, designing the policies, both fiscal and monetary uh, inclusion, should be should be in mind. Then the efficiency and the impact. So, not all spending is equal. So, we need to spend smart. Expansion of domestic revenues. So, the tax base in general in the region is very low because of the avoidance of tax and also because of the informality, there are many ways to, to, to improve it and digital technologies actually will come with the help here. Target the market's opportunities for the transformation, not just focusing on uh, innovation, but also on the ways that can uh, promote job rich transformation so that uh, people at all levels of education experience can find their jobs. Finally, the inclusive central banking. This is one of the most new parts which has to be thought through and try by trial and error and implemented and to redesign these uh, monetary policies to promote inclusiveness and promote uh, financial inclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, this would be all and uh, I think we can move to back to Sheila. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Podolsky. So if you have uh, any questions uh, um, about this presentation, feel free to use the, the uh, Q&A uh, section on Zoom, okay? And for those who are joining us on Facebook, uh, please use the comment section. So from the Asia Pacific region, let's move to the Philippines. And this time we will hear from our resource persons, their assessment of the country's public debt sustainability. And flash on the screen are the authors of the paper. And the presentation will be uh, given by uh, um, Dr. Maggie uh, de Bouquet Gonzalez, Dr. Justina Sikat, and Mr. John Paul Purpus. Dr. Gonzalez is a senior research fellow at PIDS, and her research interests are in the areas of monetary economics, fiscal, uh, financial economics, macroeconomics, and development. Prior to joining PIDS, she was an associate professor professor at the University of the Philippines School of Economics, where she headed the Financial and International Economics Committee and the Union Bank Center for Financial and Monetary Economics. Meanwhile, Dr. Sikat is a research fellow at PIDS and her academic and professional experience is focused on public sector economics and political economy. Before joining PIDS, she taught courses on public sector and development economics and fiscal and monetary policy at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Mr. Corpus, on the other hand, is a supervising research specialist at PIDS, and he has conducted policy studies on social protection, youth education, financial inclusion, and fiscal sustainability. His current research areas are um, macroeconomics and development. So, so our presenters at the IDS, the floor is now yours. I think uh, the first presenter will be uh, Dr. Justin Sika. Yes, thank you, you so much, Sheila. Yes, thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, let's just wait for the um, our slides to be shown uh, by the RID. But on behalf of the team that was um, that was flashed on the screen earlier, um, I'm here to be the first presenter on our study on fiscal effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, assessing public debt sustainability in the Philippines. Now, our uh, research questions are very straightforward. Next slide, please. Our research questions are very straightforward. Given 
is the national government's level of debt on a sustainable path. Second, is there fiscal space left for spending, which is needed for economic recovery? The objectives are also straightforward coming from this. Examine the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and related fiscal policy responses on the Philippines' public finances. The study also provides a broader historical frame for assessing the recent run-up in debt. Now, in this particular study, we perform three empirical exercises that try to determine first how the public debt to GDP ratio will evolve in the next half decade. Second, the fiscal adjustments needed to bring debt to more comfortable levels under different timeframes. And third, how fiscal policy will likely respond to debt and other relevant macroeconomic conditions. Next, please. The what, now, what was the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on Philippine public finances? Next slide, please. You can see here, let's, let's discuss first the bullets. The fiscal deficit as a share of GDP more than doubled from 3.4% in 2019 to 7.6% in 2020 and almost 9% uh, in 2021. And the primary deficit and the consolidated public sector deficit both widened to about 5.5%. Now, just to refresh your memories on these different fiscal terms, if you take a look at the figure on the upper right-hand corner, it presents the trend lines for the primary balance, which is defined as government's revenues less government spending net of interest payments on debt. So this is perceived to be the productive part of spending. This is what actually buys you the goods and services for every part for every fiscal year. Now the fiscal balance would be the primary balance and you add back the interest payments, while the consolidated public sector uh, balance includes national government fiscal balance as well as other government entities balance, such as those of social security institutions. In the Philippines, we have social security system, the GSIS government uh, security and insurance system, as well as the PhilHealth, we also have state-owned enterprises or what we know as government-owned and controlled corporations. We also have as part of the public sector government finance, uh, financial institutions, as well as local government units. So the trend lines you can see are from 1986 to 2020. The topmost trend line, which is in color blue, represents the primary balance, which has been relatively positive. As you can see, we also have marked there the different crises faced by the, the country the 1991 recession, the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you can see in the graph, the, the drop really was, was the most drastic during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now going on still to the impact on public finance in the Philippines, national government spending accelerated by 11.3% in 2020, due in part to fiscal packages by Anihan 1 and 2. These were packages that, you know, really were tried to address the pandemic, it offered social protection assistance and social safety nets, as well as, you know, it provided the necessary health care um, and health sector infrastructure, as well as assistance to certain groups like um, small, medium enterprise businesses, etc. So there was a need for government spending. We all know this during the pandemic. However, public spending growth was not unusually high and was smaller compared to public expenditure growth in most recent years. Government revenues, however, saw an exceptional decline, collapsing by 9%. And this was largely because of the contraction that was triggered by the, um, the, you know, the halt in the economy, economic activities, um, partly also because of the lockdowns. There, that's why the econo economy contracted. If the economy contracts, of course, there's a smaller base for revenues. Therefore, revenues also collapse. And you can see this better in the trend lines on the lower right corner figure here, which, re which presents the government's revenues and expenditures level and percentage changes. So the column bars here uh, represent, uh, similar to what Michael showed earlier, government expenditures exceeded government revenue. So government expenditures would be represented by the orange uh, column bar, while government revenues is presented by the blue column bar. And you can see that expenditures in the last part towards the right most of the of the graph um, exceeded considerably revenues and uh, if you look at the yellow trend line that would represent the percentage change in government revenues which drastically dropped as well because of the COVID-19 pandemic which is what triggered the fiscal deficit next slide please now the effects of large fiscal deficits of course if you have a fiscal deficit 
there would be an increased need for borrowing. So there was a significant increase in government borrowing. National government debt as percent of GDP increased from 39.6% in 2019 to 60.5% in 2021. And here you can see this at the topmost uh, trend line in the graph on the right, the blue colored one. And you can also see these are pitted against the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So after the 1991 recession, um, there was a surge in debt to GDP, as well as after the financial crisis, it started creeping up. After the global financial crisis, it did not so much um, spike, for, um, partly because we were sheltered, but also because we, there were a lot of reforms that were done in the mid 2000s in terms of revenues. Uh, this, the next spike was in the COVID uh, was after the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. So the current debt to GDP ratio is only surpassed in nineteen ninety three and in two thousand two and two thousand four, where it peaked at almost seventy one point six percent in two thousand and four. Next slide, please. Now let's decompose public debt. So this is a historical view. We're trying to determine the difference between the debt now from from previous debt crisis in the Philippines. So the current debt differs from previous episodes because unlike before there, were high there was high external debt. Um, there was also the interest rate shock in the 1980s, which, which contributed to high debt. There was also the absorption of hidden deficits of government owned and controlled corporations or, or state owned enterprises as is also known. Uh, this was absorbed by the national government, which increased the burden on uh, finance, on budgetary requirements. But at the same time, okay, the difference is that now we have a relatively more um, prospective uh, tax system in place. There are tax reform laws to address the decline in tax performance in prior years. So since 2007, as I mentioned earlier, 2005, 2007, there were reforms that were implemented. And more recently was the chain and the create laws which we are banking on to help us um, you know, raise more revenues once the economy starts to, to grow again, to recover sustainably. Now, the current debt is the result of a large exogenous shock, not because of any fundamentals or challenges, institutional challenges in the system. Um, and also because of the large decline in revenues owing to the contraction of the economy. Now, Later, I'll be showing when we look at the, the projections of debt to GDP ratio that there seems to be an accumulation of cash reserves, but this seems to be a precautionary move on the part of government. Now, next slide, please. This is also a historical decomposition of national government debt. So there are five primary sources here identified. Uh, we would have the primary deficit, which I described earlier, to be revenues less the, the productive part of government spending, which is net of uh, interest payments. There's also the real interest rate, real GDP uh, growth rate, as well as the exchange rate depreciation. Now, the sharp increase in the debt to GDP ratio in 2020 was driven mainly by the drop in growth, which is the light blue bar, uh, the last column bar on the right if you can see it for 2020, and the large primary deficit owing to the, large, the drastic drop in revenues because of the economic contraction, which is the medium blue bar. So that, 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 is, that are the primary reasons for debt right now. In earlier years, like 92, 93, it was other factors, like the assumption of contingent liabilities. Um, in other years, let's say in 1998, it was because of the exchange rate dep depreciation after the Asian financial crisis. So that's how different this, this debt is right now. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to be presenting to you the results of our analysis of Philippine debt sustainability. We're using the standard IML DSA method. Uh, next slide, please. You can download this. It's easily available. It was updated just last year. Now the basis of our fiscal outlook data for projections. Projections were based on data for fiscal, for key fiscal and other macroeconomic variables derived from first, government's medium term fiscal program as announced by the DBCC, the uh, Development Budget, Budget Coordination Committee, which is comprised of the Department of Budget and Management, the National Economic and Development Authority, as well as the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. And the consensus view of forecasters from various financial institutions and research and forecasting firms such as World Bank, IMF, CIC, and Focus Economics. These sources were chosen because of the assumption that economic 
authorities are responsible for planned fiscal policy adjustments in the medium term and consensus forecasts can contain, uh, contain adequate information while also incorporating a more representative private sector view. Next, please. So this shows you, I won't discuss this in detail. I'll just go through the logic of this. This is the debt sustainability analysis medium term trajectory. So as I mentioned earlier, this study adopted the standard DSA mod method and publicly available template of the International Monetary Fund to compute public debt and public debt dynamics in the Philippines. So the evolution of the stock of public debt is expressed as this first equation. So it simply shows that the debt in next period or in period T minus one, T plus one, depends on obligations from the debt uh, existing in the previous period, uh, period D, as well as the impact of the primary balance. So this is where the primary balance comes in. Um, the primary balance here is defined as T taxes, G is grants, so that's not government spending, uh, less the S, which is uh, non-interest uh, government expenditures. So this is how we, we would define primary balance. And if primary balance increases, that's why there's a negative sign. It means that uh, the government is raising uh, more revenues than it is uh, spending on non-interest um, expenditures. That means that there is more funds, uh, finances for, for financing the, the, the next year's budget. Therefore, there's less need for borrowing. So there would be a negative effect on the debt stock, okay? Now, there are also other one-time factors. O oh, here, it's positive. So these would be, let's say, the assumption of both implicit and explicit contingent liabilities or recapitalization of, of banks or, um, let's say, privatization um, proceeds or other things. These are other one-time factors that would add to the debt stock. Now, if you do a bit of you know, algebra and rewrite this, you can redefine this to be used to project the public debt to GDP ratio. So that would be uh, your uh, public debt as a share of the size of the economy, which is really the correct way to perceive public debt. Not so much nominal, nominal is fine, but you have to see it with respect to the size of your economy or the capacity of the economy to pay off the debt. Now, as you can see on the left-hand side of the second equation, D, the small DT plus one would be the debt ratio, the debt to GDP in the, for, in the succeeding period less uh, debt to GDP in the previous period. So this is a dynamic equation. This is what is estimated by the template. It shows the change, okay, the change in debt, the anticipated change in debt. Now there are four factors that would impact this. First would be the contribution of the effective real interest rate. If interest rates increase, the cost of borrowing increases, therefore it might increase your, it might, it is predicted to increase your debt in the succeeding period. Um, the second would be the contribution of real GDP growth. If this one has a negative uh, relationship, as according to this, um, the, as predicted by this equation, if real GDP grows, so there's an increase in your GDP, that means that there is a larger base for you to collect revenues, which means that you would have increased revenues, which would impact your primary balance, which is also in this equation, it's the fourth element there. And that would lead to uh, less borrowing requirement. So the, the change in uh, the debt to GDP ratio is expected. The impact on the change to de of debt to GDP ratio is, is negative. So you won't need to borrow as much because your economy is growing. The base for your revenues is growing. Therefore, it would have a negative impact on your debt to GDP ratio. Now, the contribution of the real exchange rate, there are two. Um, generally, when there's a depreciation, it is expected that foreign debt, okay, the value of the foreign debt, that's the valuation effect existing uh, in the previous period would increase because of the depreciation. So that would increase your, your debt to GDP ratio. Second would be the stock flow adjustment. That would be the adjustments between you paying off certain uh, debt, uh, foreign debt during this, during this period, um, but also increased borrowing um, during the same period. So there should be a net effect and it also should be adjustment for, for the exchange, uh, for foreign exchange now. Uh, adjustments. Next slide, please. Now, the result of this, we used all of the assumptions that I mentioned earlier, all government fiscal policy announced assumptions. So there are two estimations that we did here. On the, on the left, you see the evolution of debt to GDP ratio, um, just including what we observed there to be uh, excess cash reserves um, noted uh, as budgetary change in cash. Okay, so we saw this in the government accounts. 
So we accounted it for either as others or as increased debt, or we just excluded it because it could also be used to pay off debt. Now on the on the fan chart on the left, you see that the net the NG debt to GDP ratio will peak in 2023 at 66.8%. And it will stay there if you look at the matrix at the bottom until 2024 and uh, gradually declining afterwards. Okay, these are given our assumptions, which we took all from government, um, from policymakers' pronouncements. Um, the second bullet on the left would see it is assumed that the country will make efforts toward fiscal consolidation, maintaining the 1.7% of GDP primary deficit from 2024 to 2027. So that those are the assumptions here. These are government assumptions. Now, if you remove the you know change in cash and don't consider it as debt and consider it, you know something that you could use to pay off debt, uh, the debt to GDP ratio would peak still at 2023, but at a lower rate by 2.6 percentage points at 64.2 percent. Okay, next slide, please. Now we also did macro fiscal stress, stress tests, and I won't show them all in, in the interest of time here, but I wanted to highlight that the one that showed the most risk in terms of the currently established sustainable debt would be any real GDP shock. This poses the largest risk, and you look at you can look at our paper or we can discuss this in more detail later on. Now, there are other risks outside of the macro fiscal stress test that were identified, and this is consistent with both the FFCC and the DBCC. First would be the military and uniformed personal pensions. Uh, this is currently being footed by the national government. So this represents you know, a reduction in fiscal space for other spending. Second would be the possible, well, currently the PhilHealth is, has net losses. And if this is to be absorbed by the national government, this would also squeeze the resources available for other necessary spending on, let's say, human capital, such as uh, social protection, education, as well as the 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 ticket item that would give you the larger fiscal multiplier infrastructure or physical capital okay the third uh, the fourth would be the implementation of the mandanas garcia supreme court ruling for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this this represents a, sh a certain shift in governance in in the philippines uh local governments here in the decentralized um in the decentralized philippines are entitled to a share of revenues collected by government. Now, what the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court truly did is it broadened the base on which to compute the transfers that LGUs are entitled to, representing a reduction also of the fiscal space at the national level, which is which causes you know there to be increased opportunity for local governments to be partners in national development by really spending on um, local development. Now, um, natural calamities also and disasters would also um, pose risks. You know that the Philippines is brought by typhoons uh, about 20, 25, I think, is every year now. Uh, aggregate demand risks, such as the ge geopolitical risks mentioned earlier by by um, both of the both the UN representative Gonzalez as well as President uh, Orbeta, um, and uh, so this also would. Uh, possibly disrupt or you know have an impact on that sustainability risks as well as cyber security risks. So next slide please. I hand you now over to JP. JP, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Next slide please. Okay, so in this part of the study, we ask the question of how large are the fiscal adjustments that are required for the government to reduce the debt to GDP ratio to the pre-pandemic level of 40%. So just to refresh our memory, um, the government actually managed to, to bring down the debt to GDP ratio to 40%. That was the average debt to GDP ratio uh, from 2016 to 2019, and it's the lowest level of that's the lowest debt to GDP ratio in any four year period since uh, 1986. And then, uh, of course, uh, the pandemic happened and that uh, debt ratio shot up to about 54%. And in 2021, that uh, rose further to 60.5%. So, in this part of the study, we want to know. Uh, the scale of the fiscal adjustments that are required in order to go back to uh, the pre-pandemic uh, debt ratio of 40%. So we answer that uh, 
uh, question using the fiscal gap framework uh, developed by uh, Alan Auerbach of uh, University of California. So to introduce that idea, imagine that uh, we have a government with a high uh, current uh, debt to GDP ratio and it wants to uh, reduce that to some desirable level uh, at some point in the future. Now, if we assume that uh, GDP growth, the real interest rate, and the exchange rate are fixed and constant, um, then the only uh, major variable that uh, the government has a handle on uh, in order for it to manage its debt is the primary balance, which we defined earlier as the difference between uh, revenues and uh, its spending uh, less uh, uh, interest payments on debt. So the government must um, improve its primary balance uh, either by uh, cutting primary spending or uh, raising more revenues or uh, doing a combination of both. So let's imagine that the government uh, projects uh, its primary balance to follow an improving path as, as shown by the graph on the right. So we see here that the primary balance improves from uh, from a from being on deficit and it gradually that deficit gradually shrinks shrinks and uh, eventually turns into into a surplus now uh, the question is uh, whether that uh, improvement is enough to for the government to actually uh, reach its uh, its uh, debt target now uh, next next please oh, yes, sorry sorry uh, can you go back sorry so uh, let's assume that uh, that is not enough and the government actually has to, to follow a more stringent path of fiscal adjustment in order to meet its, its uh, debt target. Uh, then the difference between those two curves that you see on, 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 the, on the right is, in, is the fiscal gap. So uh, next. So in words, uh, the fiscal gap is the amount by which the primary balance expressed as a percent of GDP uh, must be increased uh, annually over its projected path in order to reach a target debt to GDP ratio over a, over a certain time frame. So uh, below we have a simplified formula for, or for uh, calculating the fiscal gap. So that says that uh, the fiscal gap is equal to the difference between your initial debt to GDP ratio and the present value of your target uh, debt to GDP ratio and minus the flow of uh, present value, the flow of the present value uh, primary balance as expressed as a percent of GDP. So what this means is that in order for a government to reach its uh, target debt to GDP ratio, it must generate a flow of primary balances that is equal to the difference between the two terms. Now, if it fails to do that, if the flow of primary balances is smaller than the difference of the first two terms, then it cannot meet its uh, target, uh, target debt ratio unless it uh, raises those primary balances by the amount of the fiscal gap annually. So in uh, this framework, uh, in the framework that we use, uh, GDP growth and real interest rates are assumed to be constant and it abstracts from foreign debt. So uh, movements in the exchange rates do not uh, affect the, the debt ratio. And there's also no feedback between uh, the macroeconomic variables. Next slide. Okay, so to calculate the fiscal gap, we need to make uh, some assumptions. So we need to set our initial year. We need to set our initial debt to GDP ratio and our target debt to GDP ratio. We need to set uh, the time frame for debt reduction. And we also need to make assumptions about the path of uh, the GDP growth rate, the interest rate, and uh, the primary balance. So here we set the initial year to 2021 and the initial debt to GDP ratio to 60.5%, which was the debt ratio uh, in 2021. We set the target debt ratio to 40%, which was the pre-pandemic level that uh, we assume the government to aim to achieve. Um, 
we calculate the fiscal gap for three alternative terminal years, 2031, 2041, and 2051. And these correspond to time horizons of 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. And we assume that the primary balance uh, improves from uh, six, negative 6.96% 6 .6 of GDP in 2021 to negative 0.81% of GDP by 2031. So uh, negative 0.81% of GDP is actually the average primary balance from 2016 to 2019. So right before the pandemic. So we are assuming that the government is going to undertake fiscal consolidation between now and 2031 in order for it to return to its fiscal position by 2031. Uh, and finally, for GDP growth and the real interest rate, we adopt uh, scenarios. So in the pessimistic scenario, the GDP growth rate is 5% and the real interest rate is uh, 4%. Uh, in the median or middle scenario, uh, the GDP growth is 6% and real interest rate is 3%. And in the optimistic scenario, GDP growth is 7% and real interest rate is 2%. So of these three scenarios, uh, obviously the optimistic scenario is the most favorable for debt reduction because it has the largest gap between uh, GDP growth and real interest rate. Pessimistic scenario is the least fav favorable for debt reduction and the median is somewhere in the middle. Next slide. Okay, so these are the range of estimates uh, of the fiscal gap. Uh, expressed as a percentage of GDP by terminal year and by uh, macroeconomic scenario. So as we would expect, the fiscal gap is lower when the conditions for debt reduction are more favorable. So if uh, the uh, GDP growth rate is higher, uh, if uh, the real interest rate is lower, and if you have a longer time horizon for achieving the debt target, then the fiscal gap is lower. So for instance, for a 2031 deadline for achieving the debt target, uh, the fiscal gap ranges from 1.4% of GDP to 3.44% of GDP. That range falls to, to negative 0.1% of GDP to 1.8% of GDP under a uh, 2041 debt, uh, 2041 uh, deadline, and it falls further to negative 0.58% uh, uh, of GDP to 1.34% of GDP under a 2051 deadline. Uh, here we also notice that uh, the fiscal gaps associated with a 2031 deadline are quite high, ranging from 1.4% of GDP to to 3.44% of GDP. So what this means is that, for instance, under the median scenario, uh, where the fiscal gap is 2.42% of GDP, uh, that means that the, that that means that there must be primary spending cuts or uh, revenue increases or a combination of both that amount to an additional 2.42% of GDP annually from 2022 to. 2031, over and above the improvements in the primary balance that we have assumed for the period. And uh, because of the large adjustments uh, associated with a short time frame for achieving uh, the debt reduction target, we think that uh, quickly returning to the pre-pandemic debt ratio of 40% would be quite challenging, uh, especially because we think that uh, fiscal policy might need to continue to be conducive to supporting uh, the country's economic recovery, especially given the, the difficult uh, global economic environment. Okay, uh, thank you. That's it for me. I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, JP. Uh, next slide. Um, so as a last exercise, we tried to assess public debt sustainability by estimating what we call fiscal reaction functions. Next slide. Uh, what are fiscal reaction functions? They are functions that help specify the fiscal policy response to public debt, controlling for other influences on uh, primary balances, 
they indicate how a government will likely react to its debt burden based on the policy track record of the country or on what similar countries were able to achieve or sustain in the past. They also uncover systematic features of the policy process and possible nonlinearities in government behavior. Now, I tried to avoid the math as much as possible, but this is inescapable. I have to show you the function in its simplest form. You have on the left-hand side um, primary balance at time t, and we want to see the relationship with the lag, uh, the year ago level, since we're using annual data, year ago level of the primary balance. We also wanted to see the relationship with lag debt, and we tried to control for other variables that influence the primary balance. Now we are interested in rho, which is the coefficient on lag debt. Why are we interested? Because it is at the center of our analysis for short run sustainability. It should be that rho is greater than the term on the right, where you have r minus g on the numerator and where r is the real interest rate and g is growth. And for long run debt sustainability, rho is also there. Uh, so rho over one minus beta is should be greater than the term on the right. So a lot of mumbo jumbo. We're really interested in rho. Why? Because if you look at the numerator and you look at its, its r minus g on the on the numerator, it's easy to see that if r minus g is negative, it is uh, the only thing you need to find out is whether rho is positive. So for as long as rho is positive, then for sure it is greater than the term on the right. And so you have both short run and long run debt sustainability. So it is R minus G. It's very intuitive. It's where you have either low uh, interest rates or high growth or both. And it's really the natural way to, to, uh, to uh, solve your debt problem, which is to grow yourself out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the debt, uh, uh, that the high debt that you may have. Okay. So this is what our economic managers always say when we want to grow out of our debt. Okay, so why is this important in the Philippine case? Next slide is important because uh, historically we do we have had um, negative R minus G. Uh, can you show the graph? So R minus G is the yellow line. So if you see it, except for the recession period, such as the 1991 recession and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's usually below the zero line. So it's usually negative, which means we only need to uh, determine rho. Okay, so the results of a regression, uh, next slide please, I'll just uh, read you the final results. Okay, uh, the key findings are one, since we have positive and statistically significant coefficients on lagged um, primary balances, we take that to be an indication of a high degree of inertia or persistence of fiscal policy. So if we have, we're in a period of surpluses that is uh, likely to go on for a period of time, if we're in a period of, of deficits, then that also will likely go on for some period of time. The next result, which is what we're really interested in, um, can you, uh, next please. Uh, so this is Rho. We found out that Rho is indeed positive and statistically significant, which means that fiscal policy in the country, in the Philippines, is generally consistent with the desire to achieve fiscal solvency. Um, so that's an important result. As would be expected, a surprise public spending leads to a fiscal deterioration because we have a, neg um, a negative, sorry, that should be negative and statistically significant uh, coefficient on the on non-interest public spending gap from the Hardrick uh, Prescott filter. Um, next slide, please. Another interesting result was that countries' fiscal authorities appear to capitalize on real exchange rate appreciation and the forces supporting it to build up primary balances and reduce debt. That is our interpretation based on positive and statistically significant coefficients on the real effective exchange rate, meaning when RER appreciates, when the exchange rate appreciates, uh, there's a tendency for surpluses to rise. Um, also, as expected, this is sort of textbook, we found uh, what we call twin deficits, where fiscal and current account deficits tended to occur simultaneously, as shown by a positive and statistically significant coefficient of the current account. Um, in one specification, so this is also another result that we'd like to uh, zero in on, fiscal effort seems to increase when debt rises above 
comfortable levels. So what is a comfortable level for our particular specification? So this is slightly different from what I showed you. We have what we call a dead spline at the mean. And if you look at the graph, it's uh, 0 0.191, it's positive and it's significant. And what this means is that when debt rises above the historical mean, that is when our fiscal uh, managers are sort of spurred to um, build up the surpluses as a way to solve the debt problem. Okay, so uh, fiscal effort in that specification seems to increase when debt rises above the historical mean. Another interesting result, for, for me at least, is that among the crisis episodes, the COVID-19 pandemic indeed had been the harshest. It had the harshest impact on the country's fiscal balances. Uh, if you look at the graph, if you look at the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the bar protrudes to the left, so the impact is negative on fiscal balances, and it's the longest line compared uh, to the Asian financial crisis and compared to the global financial crisis. Next slide, please. So um, what are the implications for fiscal sustainability in the Philippines? So historically, uh, at least based on recent history, the Philippines' debt tended to climb, the country's debt tended to climb with every recession, but government eventually managed to generate primary surpluses and to fiscally consolidate, albeit with a lack. Um, our empirical method confirms this observation and reveals behavior that is compatible with the desire to maintain fiscal solvency and to minimize the likelihood of a debt crisis. Um, developing ASEAN 5's capacity to improve fiscal balances declines as public debt escalates, which suggests natural limits to generating primary surpluses. So we also had runs for ASEAN 5, I just did not show it, but this is the result that beyond the, the mean uh, uh, for their debt, uh, uh, the historical mean for the debt, uh, it, uh, the, the parameter is actually negative which means it's harder for governments to raise surpluses when debt goes beyond that level. And that's, that's sort of intuitive because uh, that happens when your interest payments balloon, it becomes harder for you to imp make further improvements in spending, it make further improvements uh, uh, in collection, et cetera. Okay, what we find, which is interesting, is that it's the reverse for the Philippines. Uh, so you could interpret it many ways. We'd like to interpret it, it as indicative of the fact that we do try to intensify efforts to protect our fiscal conditions as debt mounts, uh, obviously within a, uh, if it remains within a reasonable range. Okay, uh, so provided, uh, so this is important, so provided there is no structural break in relation to fiscal policies and institutions. One can expect the same set of responses to debt developments in a post COVID-19 setting. So historically, this was how our fiscal authorities behaved. And for as long as they behave in the same way, then we are, uh, we could be less concerned. Okay. But uh, there has to be no major fiscal policy change. And if, there ever, if ever there is one, it has to be really carefully considered. Um, a sound fiscal track record helps allay concerns about sovereign risk and thus raise debt limits. So it helps us, a good track record actually helps us widen fiscal space, good credibility, right? Uh, strong credibility, uh, widens fiscal space, which would be useful when one needs to continue to, to support a fragile economic recovery. So that is why we uh, think that similar dynamics justify the importance of a sound fiscal consolidation strategy to prevent an escalation of financing costs from derailing growth. Okay, so we started out with a very basic question, is the debt of the government uh, of the country, given its fiscal policy and given the fiscal policy and plans of government, is it still on a sustainable path? So what have we learned? What have we learned? Now, from historical decomposition, we we sort of say, well, this time does seem to be different. This time, that is really due to the pandemic and the, the lockdown and the economic standstill. It's not due to a declining, steadily declining tax effort. It's not due to profligate spending by government. It's not due to, um, let's say, a global hike in interest rate. Well, at least not yet. So uh, when you wrote this, it wasn't. 
from standard uh, DSA, that sustainability analysis, we found out that the large increase, the run-up in debt in 2020, almost half of that was actually accumulated liquid assets. So it was a buildup of cash buffers that the government uh, uh, stored uh, in, in the event of a long haul COVID. And so there seems to be wide scope for future debt declines. Um, from fiscal gap analysis, uh, again, I just reiterate that it's not feasible to immediately aim for low debt, but it is important to have a sound medium to long-term fiscal consolidation plan from our FRFs, fiscal reaction functions, we found that there is indeed responsive fiscal policy that guarantees fiscal solvency in the region. However, there should be no structural break in terms of policies and institutions. So in terms of recommendations, it's very, very clear our recommendations are clear cut. Number one, no structural break, no fiscal policy reversals, especially hard won reforms like in agriculture, in power, in oil. No weakening of fiscal institutions, collecting agencies must collect right spending must spend uh, efficiently wisely should be well targeted we share the uh, the conclusions of michal there should be spending uh, so fiscal consolidation is not fiscal stringency in our mm -hmm. book we need to spend to avert scarring as uh, our president said but it should be well targeted and efficiently allocated along the same lines as michal healthcare education social protection especially delivery and infrastructure, we need to add that back, which uh, given our infrastructure gap, because it has both short-term and long-term multiplier effects. Of course, now in, in given a narrowing fiscal space, maybe we need to res revisit something like the PPPs that, we, uh, that were introduced uh, several years before. And then finally, there, I cannot understate the importance of a sound medium to long-term fiscal strategy. We need to rebuild our fiscal space um, and we need to sort of uh, give comfort to our creditors that we do know what we're doing and uh, we do know how to fix our, you know, our affairs. And I think that will be needed in order to maintain macroeconomic stability. Thank you. And thank you very much to our uh, presenters from uh, PIDS for that comprehensive uh, presentation, we appreciate that you have clarified a number of burning issues as to the uh, state of our, uh, the country's fiscal, fiscal health. And thank you also for uh, emphasizing the need for fiscal consolidation. Um, and also that it's important that uh, we should not have uh, policy uh, uh, reversals and other important uh, recommendations. Uh, we will hear more from our uh, speakers from uh, PIDS as well as from uh, Mr. Podolsky during the open forum. So just keep on sending your comments and questions on Zoom and on Facebook. So friends, to continue our conversation, we have two experts from esteemed government institutions in the Philippines to react to the presentations and also share the insights. And our first discussion is Ms. Illuminada uh, Sika. Uh, Senior Assistant Governor of Banco Central ng Pilipinas Monetary po Policy Subsector, which provides highly technical policy advisory and assistance to senior management and the Monetary Board on mon Monetary uh, Policy Initiatives, the conduct of research and economic and financial forecasting, and the generation of monetary financial and external statistics. SAG Sika began her career at the BSP in 1983 and has held various positions, including Director of the Department of Economic St Statistics, Managing of the then Currency Management Subsector in charge of BSP's currency operations in Metro Manila, and Head of the Regional Monetary Affairs Subsector. Ma'am, the virtual floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we would like to thank the PIDS and UNESCO for giving us the opportunity to share our insights in this webinar. My presentation will be divided into two parts. First, I will discuss the response to UNESCO survey report with particular focus on chapter four that delves on the topic of central banking for inclusive development. I will share some of our thoughts on the four areas that UNESCO identified as to where central banks can promote an inclusive development agenda 
For the second part, I will briefly discuss the BSP's other key initiatives in promoting inclusive finance. Next slide, please. Specific to central banks, the UNESCAP survey report calls for a new lens on the role of central banks to promote inclusive development agenda. Let me just repeat them. First, Central banks could consider the impact of monetary policy on income and wealth distribution and could even make economic equality as a secondary goal. Second, central bank could change investment strategies and mobilize official reserves for social purposes. Third, central bank could explore how digital currencies could foster financial inclusion by reducing reliance on limited banking services. And lastly, central banks could mobilize more financial resources for social purposes, including the promotion of social impact bonds and sustainability le uh, linked bonds. Next slide, please. Now let me share our insights on these four areas of policy focus. First, on monetary policy. As is stated in the UNESCO report, the conduct of monetary policy should be mindful of economic uh, equality and could even make equality a secondary goal of monetary policy. Let me point out that the main mandate of BSP is clear and is fixed by law. The BSP charter decrees that our primary objective is price stability conducive to a balance in sustainable growth of the economy and employment. While there are valid uh, arguments for assigning additional mandates to central banks, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic, it also bears noting that multiple policy objectives can overburden monetary policy, reduce its coherence, and lead to a loss of credibility. A central bank can, uh, a central bank can consistently pursue an active multiple goals with only one policy instrument, that is the short-term interest rate. Over-reliance on monetary policy reduces its effectiveness when the appropriate policy calls for other instruments or public institutions. Nevertheless, the BSP's inflation targeting framework has the flexibility to support other economic goals, such as sustainable and inclusive economic growth, to address economic inequality, particularly when inflation outlook is low and manageable, and inflation target is not at risk. As the report noted, the failure of the developmental central banking approach uh, before way back led many central banks in developing countries to focus narrowly on achieving inflation stability. We know this as we had our fair share of experience when the old central bank had to be restructured, partly due to the losses from development financing. Now the law explicitly restricts us from doing development financing. The BSP believes that it is only through our long-standing focus on our inflation mandate that monetary policy is able to support growth and employment, which in turn impact income and wealth over the long run. By, by reducing inflation variability and economic uncertainty, effective inflation fighting through monetary policy benefits all sectors in the economy. Next slide, please. I now go to the second recommendation on changing investment strategies and mobilize official reserves for social purposes. As reserve management is a vital part of central banking operations, the BSP integrates sustainability and environmental, social, and governance considerations implicitly through investments in green bonds. Aside from investing in green bonds as a way of promoting sustainability, the BSP since 2020 has been incorporating ESG scores as an additional criteria alongside traditional financial factors for certain tactical allocation in its investments. The BSP shares the view of the Bank for International Settlements that sustainable investments can be included in reserve portfolio without foregoing safety and return. Nonetheless, the BSP also recognizes that the accessibility and liquidity of these investments currently pose constraints. While thematic bond issuance has increased significantly, the market is still relatively small. Therefore, at this juncture, 
sustainability and ESG considerations are being implemented in BSP's non-core reserves. Currently, the BSP is looking into aligning its reserve management framework to the UN Principle for Responsible Investment, which is focusing on, among others, appropriate sustainability-related disclosures and incorporation of ESG issues into investment analysis and decision-making processes. Next slide, please. On the third recommendation on central bank digital currencies, we recognize the need to understand CBDC and know the benefits, risk, as well as policy implications before we issue a Philippine CBDC. Just like more than 80 central banks worldwide exploring CBDC, the BSP takes a proactive stance in learning digital technologies that drive the emergence of alternative payment. We recognize that digital innovations such as CBDC have the potential to leapfrog financial inclusion by enhancing the efficiency of payments and remittances, lowering the cost of financial transactions, and improving overall access to digital financial services. At present, the BSP is considering a wholesale CBDC and has established the CBDCPH project in March 2022 to implement a, plan, uh, a pilot wholesale CBDC within the year. This pilot shall be carried out to equip the BSP with the capacity and hands-on knowledge of the functionality, architecture, technology, operational, and organizational requirements of issuing and maintaining a CBDC and to aid us in building on the key learnings to pursue further CBDC projects in the future that shall enhance the existing payment system and address identified pain points. The CBDC P, uh, PH project shall focus on examining the feasibility of facilitating institutional large value fund transfer that will allow settlement even during off business hours and participation of financial institutions that are licensed uh, and, and or uh, registered with the BSP. Having said this, we would also like to highlight the necessity of having a well-functioning digital infrastructure, such as a reliable and affordable internet to support CBDC operation, a regulatory and technical know-how to issue CBDC, as well as the need for long-haul digital financial literacy and awareness programs. Next slide, please. On the fourth uh, and last recommendation about the promotion of sustainability-linked financial instruments, we note that the BSP is at the forefront of promoting sustainability principles in the financial sector. We have issued regulations requiring banks to incorporate such principles in their operations. We are also among the early investors in the BIS and the Asian Green Bond Funds. The BSP has taken a phased approach to issuing sustainability-related guidelines in view of the evolving nature of sustainable finance concepts and practices. In line with this, the BSP issued the first and second phases of sustainability-related regulations, particularly the Sustainable Finance Framework in April 2020 and the Environmental and Social Risk Management Framework in October 2021. These regulations set out the expectations on the integration of sustainability principles in banks' core strategies, governance, and risk management frameworks, especially in the areas of credit and operational risks. These rules are embedded in the principle of proportionality, which takes into consideration a bank size risk profile, and complexity of operations. The BSP is now on its third phase in its sustainability, uh, in sustainable finance-related regulations. The BSP released in June 2022 the exposure draft of guidelines on the integration of sustainability principles in banks' investment activities. The finalization of this policy proposal is targeted for August 2022. The BSP is likewise looking into potential regulatory incentives to further mainstream 
sustainable finance. In relation to this, the BSP supports the amendment to the Agri-Agra uh, law, which considered, uh, considers engagement in sustainable finance as form of compliance with the mandatory Agri-Agra credit. Agri -Agra credit. Next slide, please. Let me now go to the next part of my remarks, which will cover the other key initiatives of the BSP in promoting inclusive finance. Let me emphasize that we agree with the premise of UNESCO that central banks should include more inclusive development objectives, such as enhancing financial access, literacy, and consumer protection. We stress, however, that financial inclusion is not new to the BSP. The BSP is a pioneer in being an advocate for inclusive finance. Even before inclusive finance became a national and global agenda, the BSP has been uh, pursuing inclusion initiatives through microfinance program for uh, poverty alleviation as early as 2000. The BSP provided the enabling policy and regulatory environment for the development of microfinance in the banking system. In 2007, the BSP expanded it, its uh, microfinance uh, advocacy and became the first central bank in the world to have an, an office dedicated to inclusive finance. This is in recognition of the importance of financial inclusion and its ability to uplift not only the welfare of many Filipinos, but also its significance to the overall economy of the country. Uh, the BSP has continuously pushed for the acceleration and call for action to inclusive finance through the National Strategy for Financial Inclusion or the NSFI. Uh, in this regard, the BSP serves as the chair of the Interagency Financial Inclusion Steering Committee that drives the implementation of the NSFI. Next slide, please. The vision of the NSFI is to drive financial inclusion toward broad-based growth and financial resilience. Its key elements were defined to account for measures that reduce disparity in access and use of welfare, improving financial services, especially for the underserved and the unserved segment, as well as the MSMEs. Next slide, please. The BSP also launched the Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap 2022-2023 to accelerate digitalization in the financial sector and set its initiative and strategies in achieving an efficient, inclusive, safe, and secure digital payment ecosystem. The roadmap has two key strategic uh, objectives. First, to attain, uh, to, uh, it is aimed to digitalize at least half or of the retail payments and onboard at least 70% of Filipino adults to the formal financial system. Second, it hopes to encourage innovations which will boost real-time payment velocity. In particular, the BSP intends to have more available innovative digital financial products and services that cater to the needs of consumers. It uh, it will also be supported by the availability of modern payment services that will facilitate real-time processing of financial transactions. Com uh, uh, complementing our digitalization agenda is the recently passed Financial Consumer Protection Act. The law uh, provides regulators more power to act on and improves the resolution mechanism for financial consumer complaints, including those involving uh, cyber crimes. Next slide, please. So far, our policies to implement financial inclusion agenda have produced results. We have seen an improved financial sector landscape, especially with the digitalization of financial services, which brings more opportunities to the unserved and underserved areas. The rise of digital banks, open finance, and other fintech technology innovations are revolutionizing the design, delivery, and consumption of financial products and services. As shown in the figure in the chart, the penetration of e-money posted the most remarkable growth as it increased to 8% in 2019 from only 1.3% uh, uh, two years ago. With this note, let me stop here for now to give way to other speakers. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, 
SAG CCAT for your reactions to the um, UNSCAP report. And we also very much appreciate uh, your uh, updating us on the initiatives of um, the, um, the central bank in terms of uh, promoting um, inclusive uh, growth through your programs. Okay, friends, our second and final discussant is Mr. Hill Beltran, President, President of the Philippine Tax Academy and Chief Economist of the Department of Finance. Under Secretary Beltran works on areas including uh, fiscal policy, human resource and operations management, economic policy and research and financial inclusion policies and strategies. He also served as the executive director of the National Credit Council and chair, chairperson of the ASEAN Single Window Steering Committee. He has taught for many years at the uh, Development Academy of the Philippines and served as guest lecturer for several years at the University of the Philippines National College of Public Administration. Sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the IDS for inviting me to share my ideas on this paper, which is indeed very timely because the two years of pandemic have pushed up the NG debt ratio to back to its 2005 level and the general government debt to its 2006 level. Next slide, please. I would also like to thank uh, UNESCO for having invited me to contribute a chapter to its 75th anniversary commemorative book entitled Shaping the Future of Regional Cooperation in Asia and the Pacific. The book was made available a couple of months ago. This 75th anniversary issue urge, urge, argues that Asia-Pacific economies must prioritize inclusive growth, to which we agree. Next slide, please. I think the title of DFSF's contribution to the book serves as a starting point for discussing the paper on debt sustainability and the UNESCO survey. Uh, more than four decades ago, the Philippine economy jumped from one frying pan to another. We experienced our biggest economic slump during the crisis in 84-85, when the country suffered a severe debt crunch. It was a very difficult period and we don't like to go back to that again. To cut the long story short, since that time, we have implemented reforms on the economic and fiscal fronts to put our house in order and recalibrated our developmental objectives. Next slide, please. Up until the early 2000s, restoring stability consumed the energy of government in general and economic managers in particular. Reforms mentioned in the study, tax tariff reforms, government corporate reforms and privatization, austerity measures and prudent debt management helped restore fiscal stability. With stability issues more or less manageable, the country set its sights on growth with equity. For instance, in uh, 2010, it scaled up the conditional cash transfer program and more recently passed the universal healthcare law and the free public tertiary education law. It also established microfinance, which was uh, discussed by the central bank and microinsurance for more inclusive growth. Government also took advantage of its recently found fiscal space to embark on an ambitious infrastructure program. One critical factor that changed the Philippine narrative is the radically improved fiscal condition. Our consolidated general government debt hit a high of 65.6% in 2003, while our gross national government debt soared to 71%. 0.6% the following year. Consolidation eased pressures along fiscal fault lines, and we were able by 2019 to bring down the NG debt to 39.6% of GDP and the consolidated general government debt all the way to 34.1%. We were also able to increase the tax effort above the 14% level by 2018, thanks to train one, 
and the digitalization of revenue offices. The increased tax effort contributed to increased in spending in social services and infrastructure. The former pertains to healthcare, education, and social protection, which essentially are investments in human capital. The latter increases the economy's productive capacity and is expected to catalyze yet greater investments. Uh, the adoption of fiscal rules and practices further strengthened debt sustainability. First, uh, the Treasury single account consolidated the resources of government and optimized cash management. Second, the fiscal position of GOCCs and LGUs were monitored more closely and their borrowing subjected to benchmarks. Third, major national products of the public sector were subjected to economic rate of return benchmarks. Fourth, the government commission on, good, on government corporations was created to institute GOCC planning and set key performance parameters for government corporations. As an aside, uh, the, the government corporations were the ones that, uh, that collapsed in uh, 84, 85, when we had a big crisis. With these reforms, the national government debt, uh, debt ratio dropped from 74% to 39.6%, uh, and the GG ratio, that's general government, dropped by 3 to 21 percentage points below the NG debt ratio. The pandemic reversed these positive developments. The national government borrowed to fund anti-COVID programs, and increased the deficit to 7.6% of GDP in 2020 and 8.6% in 2021. By the end of 2021, our debt, GDP, general government debt increased to 53.4%, up by nearly 50, 20 percentage points from, from its pre-pandemic level. Our debt levels are still manageable, the PIDS authors concluded. They, complete, they compare the difference between the current situation and the past and develop a medium-term outlook, putting together the views from both government and the private sector. Next, next page, please. The PIDS paper also used fiscal reaction functions to determine the reaction of policymakers to the higher debt. The FRF results show that when the debt level climbs, Philippine fiscal policymakers adapt policies to bring this down. True, Philippine finance secretaries since the 70s have been strong adherents of the principles of fiscal responsibility. The paper says that it's also true, this is also true, not just for the Philippines, but for the ASEAN five as well. Uh, ASEAN economies have been growing at uh, real rates much higher than real interest rate and using this uh, simplified uh, debt dynamics model, when growth exceeds interest rate, the primary deficit declines, pulling down the debt GDP ratio. Next slide, please. Outgrowing debt means growing the economy. Investment-led growth in the medium term may push GDP growth equivalent to 6.5%, similar to what we achieved during the period from 2015 to 2019. We have a good chance of attaining such due to massive fiscal reforms, increased infrastructure spending, foreign investment liberalization, and measures to expand market access through uh, free trade agreements like the ASEAN free trade area. We have also cut down the corporate income tax rate from 30 to 25%, making our economy more competitive as an investment site. One comp uh, component of the debt dynamics model is narrowing the primary deficit as can be gleaned from the DBCC approved medium term fiscal program. Both the primary balance and the overall deficit are gradually being narrowed. Note, however, that the increase in revenue effort is largely because of expected improvements in tax administration and does not yet factor in new tax measures after 2021. After the collection of our performance, uh, in the first half of the year, and such new tax reforms are factored in, we expect a better uh, fiscal, medium term fiscal turnout. Expenditure efforts will decline as a pan pandemic related expenditures are wound down, and non essential 
uh, operational expenses are cut. Fiscal consolidation is a delicate balancing act because we intend to keep capital expenditures robust such that the infrastructure program remains above 5% of GDP. PPP is nevertheless expected to play an important role in infrastructure development. We have adopted the hybrid model of PPP, whereby government's contribution is right of way acquisition during the construction phase, while the private sector will take on the operations and management phase. The study also identifies threats to growth, but with a stronger central bank and a financially, and financially healthy government corporate sector, the threats are not as huge as in the past. Also, the share of foreign debt to public debt has declined, and its ratio to GDP has dropped from 36% in 2010 to 30% in 2021. Next slide, please. The DVCC medium-term fiscal program from 2022 to 2025 re-echoes the favorable outlook presented by the authors. The DVCC just is slightly uh, is just slightly more optimistic. The decline in the debt ratio will start in 2023 and not 2024, as expected by the authors. Next slide, please. To conclude, allow me to share some experts from DOF's contribution to ESCAP's commemorative book. Through various fiscal and structural reforms and judicious debt management, the Philippine fiscal sector transformed from being the Achilles heel of the economy to a strong pillar of stability and enabler of sustainable inclusive development. Along with structural reforms, fiscal policy and health has and henceforth will continue to play a decisive role in helping recover lost household incomes and reviving the economy, while at the same time remaining mindful of the stability implications of such actions. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, you signal Tran, for your uh, thought-provoking comments. Friends, uh, at this point, we have heard the presentations of our resource persons and the insights of our discussions. And this time, we would like to hear from you. So uh, we have come to the next part of our webinar, which is uh, the open forum. But before that, I'd like to inform you that we won't have a poll. Uh, we won't have a poll today, but we will have a raffle wherein we will randomly select three names from Zoom and uh, one name from Facebook and, e and each of them will receive a prize. And I will announce the winners of our raffle before we close the webinar. Okay, so um, at this point, I invite all our speakers, uh, Mr. Podolsky, Dr. Debuque, um, Dr. Debuque Gonzalez, Dr. Sikat, Mr. Corpus, SAG uh, Sikat, and Music Beltran uh, to the open forum. Okay, so let us now uh, go to um, our questions. Okay, let's start with a question uh, on economic uh, recovery. Okay, um, and this was already answered by Dr. Justine, but uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Uh, um, Podols, Mr. Podolsky and our other speakers uh, for their uh, insights. So from Anthony Alindayu, what are the strategies to promote economic recovery in the region, especially in the Philippines, considering the post-pandemic uh, era? Um, uh, Mika, uh, Michael, uh, would you like to start? Uh, yes. So, um... There is also one more question closely related about the stagflation. Yes, there is also so a question on. We can probably link from, these two. Yes, you can link link those uh, two yeah. questions, and that the question on stagflation is from Ryan Hosan Duque. Yeah, so um, maybe um, put, putting for a while monetary policy aside, which will handle the inflation in this uh, environment, there is. Uh, a part of the policies which uh, sometimes gets forgotten in addressing this kind of situation is the change in productivity. Mm -hmm. And this can be done uh, in uh, multiple ways. So what, what we mentioned, what I mentioned with the presentation, also the others, um, is this large shift in digitalization, for example. So this opens an enormous way, uh, first to generate the, the savings, increase the efficiency, 
and this opens some space also for reinvestment of, the, of these gains and to generate further growth. Uh, the second part is um, to enable uh, micro, small and medium enterprises to go uh, forward and capitalize on their ideas. And one of the limiting factors in the region and developing countries in general is access to finance for these enterprises. So this would be one of the options to, to, to consider on how to, and it's not only about the interest rate on the cost of the money, but basically enabling them to access the money at the already the market cost, which is also linked to financial inclusion, to digitalization, closing digital divide. And uh, the third option, third part of this uh, push towards also digitalization and increase the productivity is to capitalize on uh, the growing digital market. So basically to open the new space, which is uh, like uh, online sales, uh, making sure that um, customers have access to, 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 to the product. And finally, um, there is uh, one more part on having the stagflation driven by higher commodity and food prices. Uh, we should not forget about changes in productivity in the agriculture, which is um, uh, which has a huge potential, which is often lagging behind, and uh, at relatively uh, sometimes low cost can be significantly improved at, at least through uh, for teaching to increasing the capacity. So um, I, I would say that one of the uh, priorities is to how to how to increase the productivity and enable MSMEs capitalize on their ideas and how to expand their businesses and they know best how to do this but they're lacking the resources thank you mr podolsky and uh i think a part of your response also answers the question of paulo montero about how the private sector can also help in the inclusive recovery agenda especially with uh strain public finances. Um, the second part of Paolo's uh, question was any sectors for investments or initiatives to support? Uh, any thoughts on this? So I, I strongly believe that the private sector knows way more than we. So in this mm -hmm. kind of situation, Again, enabling MSMEs to make own decisions and access the finance would probably naturally drive us to, to one of the best uh, solutions to this case because uh, central steering of the economy in this kind of situation will probably uh, not uh, bring uh, expected results. Uh, and of course, there are always sectors which, like I mentioned, like agriculture, production, manufacturing, these are always the sectors which bring the returns. Uh, same as for digitalization, but uh, this can be also boosted, for example, by government, by incentive, like for instance, accelerated depreciation, which is sort of a low a zero cost subsidy to the government because uh, it, bas it decreases the, uh, it shifts the time when the taxes are paid. Uh, there could be considered to decrease the um, import taxes on certain goods which are not available, but needed for this transformation. So. In this way, uh, it would enable the economy to naturally find the best solutions. And I think this is the policymakers' best choice to allow people to uh, do uh, what, what they believe is the most suitable because they have the most information. Mm -hmm. So enabling them and facilitating the change to cu cutting the resistance, cutting the barriers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Podolsky. Now may I turn to our uh, PID speakers for their thoughts on, on these questions. Probably uh, who among you would, would like to answer I, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to, yeah. I'd go like ahead. To, okay, so I think aside from what we already uh, said in our, our, in our presentation, I think uh, it has not been mentioned yet in this particular forum that really the biggest impact of the pandemic was on on labor, okay. on so I think that is where. Uh, so we said uh, it should be targeted in efficient allocation, and I think uh, some focus must be made on the skill uh, on reskilling our workers who have been disskilled mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So I think that's one area which links to what Michelle said about raising uh, productivity. The other links to what uh, Sir Hill uh, mentioned about uh, liberalization and links also what Michelle to Michelle saying about a private sector-led recovery. 
Okay, so if you really look at the tax reform program, we have CREATE. CREATE is mm -hmm. actually re revenue reducing. Right. So, um, so what create can do for the economy is to really help spur growth. And mm -hmm. so it's a magic. We're hoping it will be a magic. That's what we're hoping. We're all hoping that it will be a good combination of having create liberalizing, uh, having your different uh, liberalization um, reforms, uh, as uh, Mr. Hill mentioned, fee, RTLA, um, PSA, all these things will gather together and help spur a private sector led recovery so mm -hmm. i think i think that is where because remember r minus g it sounds trivial but it's really mm -hmm. all there in r minus g we need to get g up mm -hmm. because you can't get r down right now because we have high global inflation mm -hmm. right and we're having high inflation at home and r just i think today uh mom Sikat, uh, probably yeah do we have a said 75 bps right increase in the policy rate which will you know sort of raise uh, interest rates so mm. it's g g is where we should you know mm -hmm. concentrate on maggie um okay may i use my um, moderator privilege to answer <laughs> this question if i may go back to stagflation should we be really worried about this ha is it already happening in the philippines or will it happen in the philippines uh, we having have strong a growth yeah. yes mm -hmm. right now we have a strong growth so I think it's less of, I mean, based on first quarter growth, we did have a very strong imprint. We had like 8% plus, okay. which is high, higher than expectations, I think. Mm -hmm. So right now, no. So how to cure stagflation? So we know from our basic economics, right? When you try to kill inflation, you bring mm -hmm. down the economy. When you try to boost growth, you bring up inflation. So it's like, I'm not a medical doctor, but I think it's more like uh, curing cancer. Okay. Uh, and chemotherapy, right? So you, you're trying to kill inflation, but you don't want to kill the person. Okay. okay. So that's, uh, so it, it's uh -huh. a balancing act for the central bank. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for uh, your clarification. And if what are the sources of growth that you are seeing? If I may throw this question to Justine this time, Dr. Sikat. So uh, yes, thank you. For your not, yeah, your question not, again. We're not... Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gonzalez said that uh, we're not experiencing stagflation, okay? Uh, so it's not a cause of, uh, for concern to us. So what are the sources of growth that you're seeing? It's not going to happen in the Philippines, having uh, stagflation, because we okay. have, no, it's growing, the economy is growing. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for that. I'm not too familiar with the sectors. I really haven't examined the sectors, but I know since the economy opened, so there's a lot of tourism now and uh, other services have been opening. But um, I actually want to relate it to one of the questions earlier that I answered, like how mm -hmm. can we grow the economy um, that was asked, which I also, which I also responded to via, via messaging. So I believe that there needs to be strategic spending. I, I agree absolutely with Michael. It's not just enough to, you know, to throw the money there. It has to be strategic spending, especially for, let's say, items that, give you the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to uh, fiscal multipliers. So that would be physical infrastructure. But of course, I'm not saying we also have to spend on human capital as well, not just physical capital, but we also have to invest in human capital as well, such as for education, social protection, and health. But this has to be well targeted because we do have limited space. Now, also, you know that I'm a very large advocate of, you know, local governments as well recognizing their role in national development. Uh, in response also to another question that was written, um, the, the Mandanas uh, Garcia Supreme Court ruling has in fact already been implemented fiscally in the sense that the allocations that were, you know, the, the, the increased allocation in the 2022 budget were fulfilled as per the Supreme Court ruling. So that already has an implication on the amount that's left to the national government to spend and it all shows should actually be spent by local government so they can truly be partners in national development by really spending on, you know, of course, what they need. Now, we're not going to dictate them. They have the autonomy. But but to really spend on, let's say, big ticket items as well. Um, one of our studies shows that uh, local governments don't really spend the mandated amount that they should on development projects, uh, which is largely infrastructure. And so I think there should be a remedy to that as well. So So those are areas where I think fiscal policy can contribute to, to outgrowing the debt. So thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sikat. Now let me jump to another topic, which is on debt sustainability. Well, our uh, PIDS speakers has uh, you know, given us a comprehensive uh, presentation on this. We have a question from Jimmy Cipriano Uy. Uh, can you give effective suggestions on how the country can recover from its massive debt? Uh, perhaps I can throw this question to uh, JP at this time and may also hear after JP uh, the, the response of uh, Yusek Beltran. Um, JP, just, uh, you know, uh, brief but uh, comprehensive answers. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I think my mm -hmm. colleagues are in a better position to, to answer that uh, question. So I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to defer to them. No worries. Um, uh, Maggie, would you like to uh, give your input to this question? Okay. Uh, okay. While uh, uh, what's the question? Uh, the how, question is: how... uh, Can you give effective suggestions on how the country can recover from its massive debt? Debt. Okay. Again, R minus G. <laughs> want G. <laughs> Let's have G. That's the most ideal. That's what we all want. That's the, you know, the most, uh, the nicest way to get us out of this. Um, so I think uh, bringing down the debt. I think. Uh, what you should remember is what JP discussed. It's really, it's going to be hard to bring it down to, to pre-pandemic levels of 40%. Mm -hmm. If you do want that, you have to what raise your tax effort by an amount that I think we've never seen before, like mm -hmm. about 3.6, 1 to 3%, I think. And I think uh, that hasn't been seen even in our last tax reform. I don't think we went as high as that in terms of uh, raising our tax effort. But in that, uh, give, having said that, I think it is, it is still important, though, that we have to have, you know, some way to raise uh, revenues. Uh, that is progressive, not so regressive. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what is fit for a uh, post-pandemic recovery. And that's why we emphasize it to be medium and long-term. Mm -hmm. It's not really now because we're just getting out of our... Uh, so I think even everybody is in agreement. I saw Congressman uh, Saceda, uh, I think, on TV the other day. And th I think that is what everybody is saying. Uh, Finance Secretary Diokno, he's saying that uh, we really should focus first on trying to squeeze the most out of our recent past reforms and trying to improve uh, administrative tax administration in order to get the revenues up. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of revenues, um, Yusik Beltran, uh, well, this was mentioned by our PIDS speakers that major uh, fiscal policy changes need to be carefully considered. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dubike mentioned uh, we need to have, uh, you know, um, revenues. We need to have additional uh, revenues. Um, are we considering, and this has also been mentioned, and I think uh, we are considering new sources of taxation, such as taxing digital transactions. And in the light of digital tax, uh, Yusek Beltran, it, do we see this happening soon? And do we have a timeline for this, sir? Actually, right now, the biggest source of the increase in revenues is tax administration. Okay. We computerize the operations of all our revenue collection offices. That's why, uh, in, uh, for instance, in uh, 2020, during the height of the pandemic, uh, we were able to pull, uh, exceed our collection by 200 billion pesos. Also, in 2021, uh, in 2022, uh, from January to May, our collections are now 78 billion higher than uh, program. So uh, much of it is really due to tax administration. Mm -hmm. uh, the new measures, we can do that for some sectors, like uh, uh, Secretary Jokno has already said, the uh, single-use plastics, which is uh, damages the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that can be done. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's... Uh, and even for alcopops, for instance, the tax rate on, uh, on vices is so low in our country. We can, there's still a chance to increase some of them. But of course, I agree with you that we cannot just do this, the increase in uh, tax rates at this point, because we are still recovering from the crisis. Yeah. 
Thank you, Yusek Beltran. Okay, let's move to another uh, question uh, pertaining also to debt sustainability. And this one is from Dr. Antonio Avila. Considering that the bulk of public debt is from domestic, uh, will a appreciation of the peso help in man managing uh, public debt? If yes, what should be the target exchange rate in the short and medium term? Okay, may I ask? Okay, I see uh, Yusik Beltran smiling. Sir, would you like to take a crack at this question first, and then I'll go to SHGC Cat. Go ahead, sir. Actually, we don't uh, we don't control the exchange rate. Uh, we allow it to uh, behave uh, in mm -hmm. the free market. Uh, the central bank can answer this better. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Yusek uh, Beltran. SHGC Cat, ma'am, maybe get your uh, insights. Yeah. We have always maintained a market determined exchange rate because we think that, uh, you know, this type of policy would balance out demand and uh, supply pressures in the market. So this would uh, uh, make sure, you know, that uh, demand uh, would be such uh, responsive to, I mean, so, uh, the demand would be responsive to the price of the uh, exchange rate. So uh, just like, um, uh, Hilbert Tran, uh, Yusek Hilbert Tran. Um, we believe that, uh, you know, the market knows this when to bet on the peso, but we just allow the peso to, uh, to uh, have its, to determine its own rate. But of course, of course, let me just put something here. Of, uh, to the extent that it will uh, uh, threaten, you know, inflation outlook and uh, this anchor uh, expectation, then we have a scope to, uh, you know, provide liquidity into the market to make sure that uh, we manage uh, uh, the volatility and it will not uh, affect uh, inflation uh, expectation as well as uh, inflation outlook. Thank you. Thank you, SAG. Now let's go to uh, another um, that sustainability re uh, related question. And this one is from DG uh, Romulo uh, Miral of the CTBRD. Why is that sustainability reckoned with respect to the national government fiscal position and not with the consolidated public sector position? Dr. Gonzalez, would you like to answer this question? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, well, one is, uh, I have to be honest, one is really data availability. Number two, uh, the IMF is already conducting its own DSA and they are using consolidated uh, data. Uh, and so actually, uh, you have a better imprint if you have consolidated. And I think the DOF, in their, in their press releases, in their public announcements, they use uh, NG uh, debt. And so we're trying to align. Uh, so we are on the same page when we're talking about, you know, debt going up, debt going down certain level. We're on the same page as they are. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. And uh, uh, with your indulgence uh, to our audience and speakers, we need to uh, extend our uh, discussion for a few more minutes um, as there are still very interesting questions that uh, haven't been answered. And this time, uh, let's go to a question in relation to the Ru Russia-Ukraine crisis. And this one is from um, Engineer Rimando to, to you. Uh, doctor, uh, specifically addressed to you, Dr. Gonzalez. Okay, since the RG is positive and may continue to be positive as the Ukraine crisis continues to affect fuel and fertilizer prices, what is your recommendation to lessen the effect of the Ukraine crisis? Uh, okay, sure, it's not uh, Dr. Sikat, sure. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a hard uh, question. So, uh, so what is the impact of, uh, so of course, we know that the impact will primarily be on, on inflation, uh, commodities, on oil, and even food, uh, because Ukraine, for instance, is a large wheat producer. Mm -hmm. So it will hit home uh, in terms of uh, global inflation and feeding into our domestic uh, inflation. And I think uh, the BSP uh, is already doing its part. 
So as I told you earlier, they're they're conducting a monetary policy uh, in in uh, in such a way as they're trying to control secondary uh, um, secondary rises in inflation, second round uh, mm -hmm. increases in inflation. And I think that's mm -hmm. as much as we can do, uh, given that uh, this is an external problem that is feeding into our our own inflation. And of course, I think the natural question that you might ask after that is, so I, I think everybody goes now to the issue of oil and gas and gasoline prices and mm -hmm. whether we should suspend the excise tax, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the same principles apply uh, targeting. It's really targeting and being mindful that our fiscal space is narrowing. And so we try to make the best uh, use and make policies that are, are uh, right, more efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, so so I think uh, giving subsidies to those who really need it would be the right policy as of the moment. Thank you, Dr. Gonz uh, Gonzalez, and I think Music um, Beltran would like to uh, provide his inputs to this question. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, the best way to handle the uh, energy crisis is to provide subsidies, targeted subsidies to uh, public transport, the mass transport system. Instead of giving it to everybody, uh, into most of the, uh, a large bulk of the consumption of oil is really uh, uh, the, the, those who own cars. Uh, so that's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, they, they account for about 80% of total uh, consumption. So if we give subsidies on the basis of cutting the uh, excise, uh, the tax rate, then we are giving subsidies to the rich instead of mm -hmm. to, to the poor. Mm -hmm. So it's better to to the, to uh, to make the uh, the the uh, subsidy targeted because this mm -hmm. will help the poor more than the rich. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yusik Beltran and PIDS. They had an extensive discussion mm -hmm. on the um, rising oil prices. Uh, this was two weeks ago. So if you are interested in uh, get in um, in the discussions that we had on uh, that uh, topic, please um, go to our uh, webinar recordings, okay? Yeah. Justine, Sheena, would you I have anything yeah. to add? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with both of, you know, Yusek Beltran and, and Maggie. We really discussed that if we're going to give support, especially with regard to you know, the fuel and oil prices, it has to be targeted mm -hmm. and well targeted. And um, perhaps we can complete the story. Um, when um, our paper came out and what uh, Dr. Gonzalez said that there should be no policy reversals, otherwise this would be a risk to debt sustainability. This mm -hmm. is a perfect example of what is meant. If we return the oil price stabilization fund or any form of general support the suspension of the excise tax, as Yusek Beltran said, this would be regressive, meaning it would be the richer that would benefit from it more. And this would mean that uh, the national government would have to perhaps, I don't know how it would be designed, but, but have to spend on that as well, rather than spending on improving, you know, um, I don't know, digital access for schooling or for health. So there's okay. always that trade off that I think has to be remembered when you're looking mm -hmm. at these different policies. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. Okay, Doc, um, Engineer Remand actually has a specific question for a SAGC cut. So here is the question, is infrastructure already in place for central bank digital currency in the whole country? SAGC cut? Yeah, thank you for that question. Right now, as I've said in my presentation, the BSP is exploring CBDC. Actually, it's lo uh, looking at wholesale CBDC. And um, we are now trying to uh, learn uh, what the benefits, the risks, and policy implications of uh, engaging in uh, CBDC. Now, before we issue CBDC, we, know to, we need to know all these things. That said, we recognize that there are barriers, including on infrastructure. Uh, I have highlighted that uh, it is necessary to have a well-functioning digital infrastructure which means uh, there should be a reliable and affordable internet to support CBDC operation. There should also be regulatory and technical know-how to issue CBDCs, as well as there is a need for long-haul digital financial literacy. So in other words, I'm trying to say as uh, we're still uh, exploring CBDC just like any other central banks before finally issuing uh, the uh, CBDC. 
Thank you, SHC Cat. Ma'am, if I may ask uh, another, uh, another question, because Mr. Polanski in his presentation mentioned that one way for central banks to promote inclusive development is to invest excess reserves as a oh. capital for local social projects. Uh, may, may we know, may I know if uh, we are doing this and how, and can you set, cite some examples? If, if what is being referred to is investment in local infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. uh, the charter, the BSP charter is very clear on which type of uh, instruments that we can mm -hmm. invest on. And um, uh, investment in uh, domestic infrastructure is not one of them. So uh, at the moment, there is a restriction in the BSP charter. And I just want to... Uh, uh, mentioned that in the past we had some pro we, we, we experienced some problem or issue with regards to developmental financing and uh, when we uh, plan to engage in similar activity as proposed by UNESCO we must make sure that there are um, you know measures so that we don't fall into the same mistake as we did you know years back uh, mm -hmm. that resulted to the restructuring of the BSP. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, SAGC Cat. Now let's move to um, another topic, which is fiscal consolidation efforts. And we have another question from BG Miral. How would you assess the past fiscal consolidation efforts in terms of their equity impact? Um, may, know, may we know who among you would like to answer this question? Of, okay, let's start with our uh, PIDS speakers. Maggie, would you like to answer this? I haven't really conducted uh, a study on this, so I'm not really that comfortable uh, um, commenting on it. Okay. Uh, I, but but I do have a rejoinder to mm -hmm. Mam Sika. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, we did uh, uh, in the past. Um, the central bank racked up a lot of you know liabilities because exactly of what she said. Uh, the central bank going into development financing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, the, the so the B, the new BSP was was created minus all those debts, right? And uh, I think I don't know how this links. If the plan is to tap the reserves of the central bank, um, I, I and linking it probably to the creation of some kind of sovereign wealth fund. I think that's the the area of discussion, and we've been going f back and forth on those lines. And I think uh, one, uh, well, one of course, Doc um, um, Sikat was saying that well, it's in the charter that you cannot touch that, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. reserves. The second one is given our uh, BOP, our current account uh, historical up to the present. Do we really have enough? Uh, to continue on because really now we are dependent uh, a lot on remittances mm -hmm. and meaning the volatility of, of the inflow. So I think mm -hmm. they really have to study that because yeah. those reserves are important to maintain mm -hmm. also financial stability. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, it's important for outsiders to, to write, write mm -hmm. to, if they're um, assessing financial stability of the country, they, they automatically look at the reserves. So how, how does that play into, you know, putting those monies into, the, uh, uh, into a project uh, that is not the expertise of the BSP, mm -hmm. etc. So these things uh, is correct. I think we, this should be well studied before uh, anybody even tries to to go into okay. it. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Yusek Belchan, would you like to answer the question of DG Meral? Yeah. Uh I can't remember the question, but... Uh, okay, the question, sir, is uh, how would you assess past uh, fiscal consolidation efforts in terms of their equity impact? Well, actually, uh, the, the poverty rate has been declining from 2015 to 2018, when we had a very healthy uh, growth rate. Uh, actually, the, uh, the, uh, the, the poverty rate went down significantly. And, uh, but because of the, uh, of the pandemic, it went up again. So uh, during the next few years, we need to, uh, uh, to push for more growth-oriented uh, spending. And of course, the social spending is there. It's uh, required by law. And we should continue doing those. Mm -hmm. Those uh, uh, CCT, et cetera, et cetera, and the infrastructure program can give us a higher growth rate 
that will allow us to uh, cut down poverty again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what uh, we are looking at in the medium term. Mm -hmm. And thank, thank you, uh, Yusik Beltran. If, if I may maximize your presence on the screen. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Michael Angelo too. Uh, he's asking if um, the fiscal consolidation, if current fiscal consolidation efforts and re resource mobilization plan of the previous administration, and I think he's referring to the train, etc. Do you think those can address the debt of, of the country? Well, a while ago, uh, uh, Dr. Debuke and his team said that we should continue the path to reforms and there should be no policy reversals. And I think that includes okay our, uh, um, re our um, policies on, on tax reform. Oh, actually, if you look at the... Uh the uh, medium term target which I showed a while ago, mm. it would show that uh, uh, the uh, deficit is going to go down, definitely. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we will continue to do the uh, infrastructure spending and uh, the social spending will continue because we believe that the only way uh, we can grow is through uh, spending on those health, education, and then infrastructure. All of those will continue to be supported by government. Mm -hmm. Sir, um, okay, related to this is a question from Facebook, Raquel Castillo. Doesn't fiscal consolidation include measures to stop leakages rather than just make tax revenues spending more efficient? Well, you already uh, emphasized mm -hmm. that we, we have improved in terms of tax administration. That's true, that's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are uh, focusing on tax administration improvements. Uh, we are... Uh, studying the, all the sectors to see if they're uh, complying with the tax obligations. Uh, we have uh, 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 computerized their operations, setting up uh, uh, computer platforms to, to make uh, it easier for the people to pay their taxes online. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we are training the, uh, we have training programs under the, uh, the uh, uh, what, Philippine Tax Academy to improve the uh, quality of our revenue collectors through, uh, uh, through uh, uh, training programs. Actually, in the case of local governments, uh, they have continuing programs under BLGF, Bureau of Local Government Finance. They continue to be trained by BLGF so that they can, uh, they can uh, collect more taxes, improve their collection rate, and also to uh, improve their their allocation of, uh, of uh, budget, of their budgets. So they are now being trained by DAP in coordination with BVM, NEDA, and uh, the DOF. So uh, in the ne near future, we can expect that uh, local governments will be more active in, uh, in setting up uh, infrastructure projects that will move their uh, communities forward. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yusik Beltran. So, friends, we are down to our last uh, three questions. Uh, we apologize that we cannot, can no longer take further questions. Okay, so we have a question from um, Mr. Julius Dumangas, and this one is to Dr. Gonzalez. In the medium term, what is your estimate of the medium term and annual size of fiscal consolidation needed to bring the debt to GDP ratio to pre pandemic level? Dr. Um, Gonzalez, uh, This is the one that JP can answer because he was the one working. Okay. On thank you, very, thank you. Uh, JP. JP. <laughs> yes. Um, so the size of the fiscal consolidation. So actually, so if with medium term is ten years. Um, so for the lack for lack of a of government projections that extend to 2031, uh, we simply assume that uh, the government is going to uh, improve its fiscal balance from about negative six point nine percent to negative zero point eight one percent which is just a return to its uh, pre-pandemic fiscal position. And even that is not enough. Even returning to, if the government were to aim to uh, 
go back to its uh, pre-pandemic debt ratio level of 40%. Even going simply going back to its pre-pandemic fiscal position is not enough. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would have to, by 2031, run something like a primary surplus of 1.6% of GDP. Uh, in the median scenario of of six uh, percent uh, GDP growth and uh, a real interest rate of three percent, so that does not even uh, consider factors such as what if um, GDP growth is lower and real interest rates are higher. And in 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 those in, in those scenarios, uh, the the fiscal adjustments would have to be would have to be higher than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, may I add to that? Also, yes. I think the main message of our paper also is that uh, we don't need to go back to that level yet. Okay, uh, so we, we don't need to to uh, go back to that low of a level, number one. Uh, number two is that uh, what are we really uh, looking at is that 60% indicative cap. Uh, okay, so we said that uh, half of the accumulated debt was really accumulated liquid assets, so it's still there, uh, meaning uh, debt is less worrisome if you think about that, that a large part of that is uh, liquid. And uh, why, uh, so meaning anytime it can be brought down, but it also is needed by our national treasurer in order uh, to manage uh, the affairs. So uh, it's really a matter now of our economic leaders um, convincing the creditors that really, even if we are slightly above that 60% mark, there's uh, really, uh, it's really not the end of the world. Uh, you don't need, uh, you know, to add too much of a risk premium. And I think that is what has been done. And I think the creditors actually, the big creditors actually know, know of this situation and they are not uh, worried, not that worried. Um, so it goes back to our, the portfolio that we have, as um, Sir Beltran said, our portfolio has vastly improved. We have longer term debt. We have mostly domestic debt, and even our foreign debt, a lot of that is held by domestics. Okay, mm -hmm. so so the financial stability risk is actually minimal, even with that thirty percent. So thirty percent foreign uh, currency uh, debt is higher than the ASEAN. But if you think about it, let's say compared to Indonesia, a large part of their foreign debt is really held by foreigners. Ours, most are with our domestic financial institutions. So, yeah. Thank so you. Uh, thank you, um, Maggie. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, and to uh, Ajiti. Okay, we have another question still on fiscal consolidation. If I may throw this question to uh, Mr. Podolsky um, from Julius Dumagas, given our current economic and fiscal context, and this refers not just uh, to the Philippines, but this is also very le relevant in the context of the Asia-Pacific region. Should fiscal consolidation be more driven by increased revenues, revenue efforts, or by expenditure cuts? Uh, Mr. Podolsky, would you like to answer this question? Because you mentioned in your presentation that, okay, cutting on debt shouldn't affect expenditures for healthcare, education, and social protection. Okay. Please, um, Mr. Podolsky. Sure. So, um... I would not make this split. These are two different parts uh, of the fiscal policies. Increasing the revenues is uh, one uh, target which has to go its own way, that fiscal revenues are low in general in the region, and there are ways to increase them, uh, mm -hmm. and especially to, in, to uh, take more fiscal revenues for uh, better of households and uh, do not even touching the low-income households. And the second thing, uh, cutting expenditures in this uh, kind of environment, uh, it would be very dangerous. And uh, if we have in mind poverty and inequalities, uh, then cutting these expenditures would have most negative effects on people at the low income levels. But uh, again, it's we, we have to think if there is a need to cut or spend more efficiently and cut the losses. And these are the big, uh, untapped resources which are not used and so instead of thinking where where to spend less let's, let's let's think what we have and how to spend it wiser 
because uh, in this inflation environment, if we have a nominal expenditure which actually stays the same, uh, it will be in a real, actually, in real terms, it will be actually uh, a cut. So I, I would distinguish the revenues, they have to grow, they have to follow in our path, mm -hmm. and the expenditure, uh, if we want to fight with inequalities, support the poor people, decrease the poverty and recover stronger and more sustainable, there is not really much way to uh, to cut them. This is like an extreme situation, which, which was still not there actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for your input, Ms. Podolsky. So yes, uh, it's not an either or thing, but we should endeavor to increase revenues, make uh, expenditure cuts, but not to the point that we are sacrificing uh, healthcare services, education, and other important uh, social services. Okay, uh, we have a question, last two questions from uh, Dr. Miral. How would you assess the Philippine con social contribution system as a means of financing social protection and its implication on the fiscal space? would like to answer um, this question um, from our uh, PIDS speakers. Would any of you would like uh, to answer uh, this question, uh, Justine, Dr. Sikat? Well, the thing is I haven't really examined it yet. So, so I, I wouldn't, I'd be very cautious in, in, in giving a response mm -hmm. to this, uh, what, yes. what is exactly meant by that. So thank you so much. Yeah. We would like to hear the thoughts actually of our, our guests because uh, yeah, the usual, uh, I know we say is that that's private money, right? That's mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. contributions of private individuals. Because it's social, um, um, yeah, social so, security system. So, yeah. we, we may want to hear, can, can we uh, uh, hear the thoughts of uh, Yusek uh, Beltran? Sir, please. Actually, uh, we have been uh, trying to improve the uh, financial condition of uh, SSS and GSIS okay. so that uh, they will be able to uh, provide the uh, pensions uh, to uh, retiring uh, officials and employees. Uh, we continue to do that. Uh, and uh, we oppose any uh, measure that will uh, that will reduce the uh, financial viability of these uh, corporations. At the same time, the actually the best way to uh, to help the poor is to uh, get them to engage in productive activities, uh, providing them loans to finance and MSME projects, things like that, microfinance, microinsurance. All these things will help. Uh, uh, poor families uh, uh, recover from any uh, disaster or any crisis that uh, befalls them. Thank you, Yusek Beltran. And this uh, final question, sir, is for you. Uh, it's about the feasibility of reforming the tax system. This one is from Angela Kabadi. Is it feasible to reform the tax system to benefit the low wage earners and middle income class? For example, increasing the tax base and lowering the tax rate and, consider, and considering inflation indexing? Actually, uh, in the case of our tax system, for individual income taxes, there's already a, uh, a uh, provision which says that if uh, for those earning below uh, uh, minimum wage, you don't have to pay income taxes. Uh, so uh, this, uh, and for those who don't have incomes and are considered poor, uh, we give uh, CCT uh, mm -hmm. and other, uh, uh, and other uh, social uh, uh, spending. We, we try to, as much as possible, to maintain our spending for health and education mm -hmm. because this is uh, the best way to uh, get them to contribute more to the economy. Okay, thank you, Yusek Beltran. So friends, um, we are um, closing uh, the open forum. So just to cap our discussion, may I ask each speaker for some brief parting words? If you have, um, starting with Mr. Um, uh, Mikhail uh, Podolsky of UNESCO. Sure. So um, maybe referring to uh, the last discussions again, 
uh, because I think it's important. It's sometimes when we look at the ideas on what course to develop, what sector to develop, uh, there is no clarity. But actually, uh, referring, for instance, to also Dr. Leto, Mr. Bertrand said, we have this amazing tool these days, which is digitalization. And uh, investing in this, uh, in both uh, on administration level and the economy, private sector level, uh, gives us these days extreme returns. So I think if I would say on some kind of policies to pursue, which will support in general the SDG agenda, it's certainly to spend smart on uh, digitalization, which will have ex extremely uh, rich multiplier effects in almost all parts of the economy. And uh, as, uh, as we should think about this crisis as not something which will fade away overnight because it looks it will stay with us for a couple of years uh, because it's a, a global supply constraint uh, challenge which will not resolve itself soon. Then again, these kind of measures which will increase long-term productivity and will position the economy uh, to run on a low cost model with lots of efficiency, uh, especially with the fiscal constraints is probably uh, one of the most important takeaways, I would say, for the coming years. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Podolsky. Okay, and now may we hear from our resource persons from PIDS, and I think Dr. Uh, Debuque Gonzalez will speak on behalf of the team. So I just like to reiterate, reiterate our main messages, no structural break, no fiscal policy reversals, no weakening of financial institutions, spending to avert economic scoring that is well targeted and efficiently allocated, a sound long term to medium term, uh, medium term to long term fiscal strategy to rebuild fiscal space and to maintain macroeconomic stability. Thank you very much, Dr. Tubike and to your uh co-presenters as well. I hope that what you said uh, was heard by our uh, policymakers. Okay, and now may we hear from SAG Sika, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate that the BSP remains committed to its primary objective of pursuing monetary policy action. And uh, we believe, we strongly believe that by reducing inflation variability and economic uncertainty, effective inflation fighting through monetary policy benefits all sectors in the economy. And uh, lastly, uh, the BSP believes that it's important to uh, push for inclusive finance. And as a matter of fact, BSP is a pioneer and an advocate for uh, Okay, I think we lost uh, SAGC cut. Okay, so may, may we now hear from uh, Yusek Beltran. Yeah, the uh, economic uh, team of the Philippines uh, are very professional. They're very good. Uh, for uh, about the 44 years that I was working with government, they are all adherents of fiscal responsibility. Uh, we would like to assure those uh, listening to us right now that uh, the, uh, the secretaries of finance will continue to uh, improve fiscal, uh, fiscal measures to make sure that uh, stability is maintained uh, because the, the, the only way we can uh, grow is by making uh, our fiscal sector strong and uh, viable. Thank you. Thank you, Yusek Beltran. And I I saw that uh, SAG CCAT is back online, ma'am. Uh, maybe you would like to finish your uh, brief, uh, brief final remarks. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, I, I will. I, I didn't know I, that I was cut uh, online. <laughs> anyway, just to reiterate what I said, I said that the BSP remains committed to its primary objective of price stability. And we believe, strongly believe that uh, reducing inflation variability and uh, economic uncertainty, uh, effective inflation fighting through monetary policy benefits all sectors in the economy. And uh, we also uh, believe in inclusive finance. And as a matter of fact, we are an advocate and a pioneer uh, in pushing for uh, uh, inclusive finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Friends, please join me in thanking all our speakers for the nuggets of wisdom that they have shared with us this afternoon. And also thank you to all those who join in the discussion by sending your comments and questions. Let us show our appreciation through a, through a big virtual clap. Okay. And friends, you are the winners of our webinar uh, raffle. They are, okay, from Zoom, uh, Burmar Torres, uh, Camille Joy Ramirez, Earl John Pajaro. And from uh, Facebook, Raquel Castillo. So to all our, to all the winners of our raffle, um, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. So you can access all the presentations from today's uh, um, webinar on the PIDS website. And please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. In addition, please regularly visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of all our events. And flash on the screen are our webinars in the succeeding weeks. On July 21, we will hear the Philippines. Um, we, uh, on July 21, we will have our webinar on the Philippines irrigation, uh, irrigation sector and health, uh, health insurance program. And our uh, um, resource speakers for this topic will be uh, Dr. Ro Roelano Briones and Dr. Michael Abrigo our senior research fellows who recently received achievement awards from the National Academy of Science and Technology. Then on July 28, we will have our last webinar for July, which will tackle the Philippines' bottom-up approach to disaster risk reduction and management. And our resource speakers for that webinar will be Dr. Sunny Domingo and Ms. R.B. Choi Manihar. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academic, civil society, business, and international development community that join us today. The names of those uh, organizations are flashed on the screen. So friends, this concludes our virtual policy forum for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and see you next week. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.